Hello, friends. About 70% of the friends who watch my videos are not subscribed, and I would be very happy if you did. Also, don't forget to press the like button and leave your comments. Your interaction makes the content reach everyone and contributes to the growth of the channel. Thank you all. From which country or city do you follow the channel? My name is David Johnson. What I'm about to tell you happened on July 23, 2012, a date seared into my memory like a brand, a nightmare from which I've never truly awakened. Before that day, life was simpler. I wasn't some government-sanctioned monster hunter, just a park ranger in the sprawling Evergreen Heights National Park, nestled in the heart of Montana's rugged wilderness. It was good, honest work. I spent my days maintaining trails, educating visitors about wildlife safety, and occasionally rescuing the odd, unprepared hiker. The majestic beauty of the forest was my office, the crisp mountain air my constant companion. I never imagined that the very land I'd sworn to protect would become the stage for a horror beyond comprehension. The morning of July 23rd dawned crisp and clear, the kind of summer day that makes you grateful to be alive. I was sipping my first cup of coffee in the ranger station when the call came in. A hiker had gone missing on the remote Shadowfall Trail deep in the most isolated part of the park. Not just any hiker, mind you, but Marcus Harding, a seasoned outdoorsman known for his survival skills and intimate knowledge of the area. We assembled a small search team, myself, veteran ranger Tom Cooper, and Elena Rodriguez, a rookie on her first big assignment. Tom was a grizzled old-timer, his leathery face a roadmap of decades spent in the wilderness. Elena was all wide-eyed enthusiasm, her ranger uniform still crisp and new. Routine stuff, Tom grunted as we loaded up our gear. Probably just wandered off the trail, got himself turned around. I nodded, but something gnawed at the back of my mind. There had been whispers lately, strange stories from the locals, unnatural sounds echoing through the valleys at night. Livestock found mutilated on ranches bordering the park, their bodies arranged in bizarre patterns. We dismissed it as tall tales, the fevered imaginings of isolated mountain folk. Now I wasn't so sure. The Shadowfall Trail was aptly named. It wound through dense primeval forest, where the canopy was so thick that daylight struggled to penetrate. Moss-covered boulders loomed like sleeping giants, and gnarled roots seemed to reach for your ankles with every step. As we pressed deeper into the wilderness, an unsettling quiet descended. The usual chorus of birdsong and chattering squirrels was absent, replaced by an oppressive silence. Hours passed with no sign of Marcus. No discarded equipment, no trail markings, nothing to indicate he'd ever been there at all. Tom's hand kept drifting to his holstered sidearm, his eyes scanning the undergrowth. Elena's earlier excitement had faded, replaced by a palpable unease. Maybe we should turn back, she suggested, her voice barely above a whisper. Call in more resources, start fresh in the morning. I was about to agree when Tom held up his hand, freezing us in place. You smell that? he asked, his nostrils flaring. At first, I caught nothing but the usual forest scents, pine resin, damp earth, decaying leaves. But then it hit me. A coppery tang, sharp and sour, completely out of place in these woods. My stomach clenched as we followed the odor off the main trail. We found Marcus Harding's body half-hidden beneath the gnarled roots of a fallen sequoia. For a moment, my brain refused to process what I was seeing. This wasn't the ravaged remains of a bear attack or the bloated corpse of an accidental fall. No, this was something else entirely. Marcus had been dismembered with surgical precision. Each limb separated cleanly, no ragged flesh or splintered bone. His torso was splayed open, organs removed and arranged in a bizarrely purposeful pattern around the body. Most disturbing of all was his face, eyes wide open, frozen in an expression of utter terror. Sweet Jesus, Tom muttered, his gruff demeanor cracking. This ain't natural, this ain't natural at all. Elena turned away, retching into the underbrush. I stood rooted to the spot, my mind reeling. In all my years as a ranger, I'd never seen anything like this. Suddenly, the vastness of the wilderness pressed in on me. I felt small, vulnerable, like a mouse that's just realized it's wandered into a snake's lair. 
A twig snapped behind us. We whirled around, weapons drawn. But it wasn't a mountain lion or an angry moose that emerged from the shadows. It was a man, or something that looked like a man. He stood well over six feet tall, his muscular frame wrapped in tattered camouflage gear that seemed to blend seamlessly with the forest. A wild, matted beard obscured most of his face, and a battered bush hat cast his features in deep shadow. But his eyes... God help me, I'll never forget those eyes. They glowed with an unnatural, vibrant yellow light. Not the reflected gleam of an animal's eyes in the dark, but an internal radiance that spoke of something utterly inhuman. What in God's name happened here? Tom demanded, his voice trembling slightly despite his best efforts. The figure didn't respond. It simply tilted its head, regarding us with an eerie stillness. I had the nauseating sense that we were being studied, evaluated like insects under a microscope. My survival instincts screamed at me to run, but my feet felt rooted to the forest floor. Elena whimpered, a small broken sound that seemed to snap the tension like an overstretched rubber band. The thing moved. It wasn't quite a run, more like a blurring lunge that defied the laws of physics. Tom managed to squeeze off a shot, the crack of his pistol shattering the unnatural silence but the bullet seemed to pass right through the camouflaged figure as if it were made of smoke. In the space of a heartbeat, it was upon Tom. What happened next, I can scarcely bring myself to describe. The creature moved with inhuman speed and brutal efficiency. There was a sickening crunch of bone, a spray of crimson, and a scream that was abruptly, horribly silenced. Elena and I ran. We tore through the forest, blind panic driving us forward. Branches whipped at our faces, roots threatened to trip us with every stride, but we didn't dare slow down. Only when my lungs felt ready to burst did we pause, ducking behind a massive fallen tree. For endless, agonizing minutes we crouched there, hardly daring to breathe. The forest had gone deathly quiet again. No sign of pursuit, no sound of footsteps, just that oppressive, unnatural silence. We have to keep moving, I whispered, my voice hoarse. Back to base camp. We need to call for help. Elena nodded mutely, her face ashen. We set off at a more measured pace, constantly scanning our surroundings for any hint of movement. The journey back seemed to take an eternity, every shadow concealing potential horrors. When we finally stumbled into base camp, our story spilled out in a frantic, disjointed mess. The other rangers stared at us in disbelief. Some assumed it was shock-induced hysteria, others theorized about a rogue bear or mountain lion. But I knew what I had seen, and the haunted look in Elena's eyes confirmed it wasn't just my imagination. They sent in a specialized search team, heavily armed and equipped with the latest tracking technology. They scoured the area for days, but found no trace of Tom's body, no sign of the creature we'd encountered. The official report chalked it up to a tragic wilderness accident, likely an animal attack. Case closed. But I know the truth. I know what lurks in the dark heart of those forests. In the years since that day, I've done my research. I've connected with others who've had similar encounters, compared notes, and pieced together a chilling picture. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't an isolated incident. There are reports, stretching back decades, centuries even, of similar creatures stalking the wild places of the world. Some theorize they're some kind of evolutionary offshoot, a branch of humanity that developed in isolation. Others whisper about government experiments gone wrong or extraterrestrial visitors. Me? I don't pretend to know what they are or where they come from. I just know they're out there, watching, waiting. I retired from the ranger service not long after the incident. Couldn't bear to go back into those woods, knowing what I know now. Even all these years later, I avoid remote forests and isolated trails. Sometimes, when the night is especially dark and quiet, I swear I can hear unnatural movement just beyond my peripheral vision, a flicker of those inhuman yellow eyes in the shadows. To those who still venture into the deep wilderness, I offer this warning. Be careful out there. The greatest predators aren't always the ones with claws and fangs. Sometimes they wear a mockery of human form and hunt with terrifying intelligence. And if you ever find yourself alone in the forest, feeling that prickling sensation of being watched, run, run, and pray it isn't already too late.
My name is Thomas Wilson. What I'm about to tell you happened to me in September 2001. I've never spoken of this before, and I don't consider myself a storyteller. But I have a feeling you won't believe me anyway, so here goes. I work for a clandestine government organization that specializes in hunting monsters. You won't find any information about us online, and that's by design. If word of our existence ever got out, well, let's just say you might find some men in black suits knocking on your door at midnight. Our team has a code name, Shadow Hunters. I'm the reconnaissance specialist. My job is to scout, analyze, and report back. We were summoned to a national forest in Oregon after a series of unexplained disappearances. At first glance, it seemed like a routine missing persons case. Hikers and campers vanishing without a trace. No bodies, no evidence. The locals blamed it on bears and mountain lions, which made sense on the surface. But the frequency of the disappearances over such a short period raised red flags. Then came the disturbing evidence that pushed this case into our territory. Photographs surfaced, blurry but unmistakable. They showed a massive dark figure, hunched over what was clearly not a pile of leaves. The entity was humanoid but impossibly tall, towering over any professional basketball player with a build that suggested immense strength. Those photos were what brought us in. We arrived at the forest under the cover of darkness. Our team consisted of four members, Rodriguez, our muscle and a bit of a hothead, Chen, our tech expert and the brains of the operation, Dr. Patel, our medic, and probably the only reason I'm alive to tell this tale, and myself, Thomas Wilson, the eyes and ears of the team. We set up our base camp near a secluded trailhead. The night was unnaturally warm, even for late summer. There was an eerie stillness in the air that set my nerves on edge. We took turns keeping watch, two on duty while the other two rested. Dr. Patel and I took the first shift. Hours passed uneventfully, with only the usual forest sounds breaking the silence. Around 2 a.m., we handed off to Chen and Rodriguez. I had just drifted off to sleep when a blood-curdling scream jolted me awake. It was Rodriguez, his voice filled with raw terror. I grabbed my rifle, Dr. Patel right beside me. We burst out of the tent to find Chen missing. His sleeping bag was torn open, a single drag mark in the dirt leading into the dense undergrowth. A low, primal growl echoed from the darkness. It wasn't a sound I recognized from any known animal. Dr. Patel raised his flashlight, sweeping the beam across the tree line. For a split second, we saw them. Two massive, reflective eyes staring back at us. Dear God, Dr. Patel whispered. It was just a glimpse before the thing retreated into the shadows. But its outline was all wrong. The arms and legs were too long, its gait a loping stride that spoke of unnatural power and speed. Rodriguez was still screaming Chen's name, his voice growing hoarse. We pulled him back towards the tent, trying to regroup. We have to go after him, Rodriguez snarled, shaking us off. No. I said firmly. We call this in and wait for backup. And let that thing pick us off one by one? Rodriguez shouted. He had a point, but I wasn't about to throw our lives away on a suicide mission. I grabbed the radio, but all we got was static. Our equipment was jammed somehow. It knows, Dr. Patel said, his eyes wide with realization. He wasn't wrong. As daybreak painted the forest in sickly hues, we felt exposed and vulnerable. We decided to head back to the main road, hoping to reach higher ground where we might catch a signal. We didn't make it far. There was a clearing just at the edge of the tree line. In its center, Chen hung suspended ten feet off the ground, impaled through the chest on a massive wooden spike jutting from the earth. It was fresh wood, as if a tree had been ripped out, sharpened, and I turned away, bile rising in my throat. Dr. Patel knelt, hands shaking as he reached for his med kit, though we all knew it was futile. Rodriguez was silent, a dangerous glint in his eyes. I'm going to kill it, he growled through clenched teeth. We tried to navigate around the clearing, but every path seemed to lead back to its center, as if the forest itself was guiding us towards that grotesque display. The air grew heavier, oppressive. A loud snap echoed through the trees, we spun in circles, rifles raised, adrenaline pounding in our ears. Then a massive shape fell from the canopy, landing between us and the clearing. It was the creature from the night before in all its terrible glory. A towering giant at least nine feet tall. It was gaunt and starved looking, 
with skin stretched tight over bone. Its face was elongated, almost like a dog's muzzle, filled with razor-sharp fangs. Long, clawed arms hung nearly to its knees. Rodriguez didn't hesitate. He raised his rifle and opened fire. The bullet slammed into the creature, making it jerk with each impact, but it kept coming. Dr. Patel grabbed my arm and pulled me back. We ran blindly through the forest, branches tearing at our faces, the sounds of the creature's relentless pursuit right behind us. Bursts of gunfire from Rodriguez echoed, growing fainter and fainter until they stopped altogether. Dr. Patel tripped, and I crashed down with him, tumbling into a ditch. I rolled underneath a tangle of roots and vines, dragging him with me. Silence fell around us. Not the peaceful silence of the forest, but the heavy, watchful silence of a predator. I strained my ears, listening for any sign of movement. Dr. Patel, I hissed. A faint groan came from beside me. Relief flooded through me, quickly replaced by guilt. We had abandoned Rodriguez. There was no way he could have survived that encounter. We had to keep moving. I pressed my ear to the ground, listening. Nothing. Maybe it was gone. Maybe it had lost our scent. We spent hours crawling and weaving through the dense undergrowth. The forest felt like it was closing in on us. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig made me jump. Finally, we came across a dirt road, the first sign of civilization we had seen in what felt like an eternity. We followed it, hoping it would lead us out of this nightmare. We didn't speak. The weight of Rodriguez's death hung heavy between us. A noise up ahead made my hand tighten on my rifle. Relief washed over me when I saw the headlights of a truck approaching. It slowed as it drew closer, the driver peering out with a puzzled expression. Hey, fellas, he called, suspicion evident in his voice. Y'all lost? We must have been a sight, covered in dirt and scratches, our eyes wild with exhaustion and terror. I managed to explain about the creature, stumbling over the words. It sounded insane even to my own ears. The driver's expression shifted to one of amusement. Now, I've heard some tall tales in these parts, but that one takes the cake. Bigfoot, aliens, what'll it be next? It was futile. No one was going to believe us. I thanked him for the ride back into town and refused to answer any more questions. The local sheriff gave us similar treatment, concern mixed with thinly veiled mockery. They thought we were just lost hikers, maybe a little rattled after a cougar scare. Back at headquarters, the debriefing went as expected. Skeptical faces, raised eyebrows. Disbelief hung heavy in the air. We were ordered to take two weeks of leave, with mandatory psychological evaluations scheduled. We were branded as the crazy ones, the agents who saw things that didn't exist. We never saw the creature again, but I could feel it, lurking in the shadows of my mind. It had hunted us, played with us, and it could strike again anytime, anywhere. It knew who we were, it knew where to find us. For Dr. Patel, the damage was worse than any physical wounds. The nightmares stole his sleep. Whispers from the darkness filled his waking hours. He couldn't shake the image of Chen, the feeling of helplessness, of being trapped. They said it was PTSD, but I knew it was something more. A year later, Dr. Patel took his own life. They cleaned out his locker, sent the standard condolences to his next of kin. Life at the base moved on as if he'd never existed. I'm still with the team, ten years later. We hunt the things the rest of the world doesn't believe in, the things the government knows damn well are real, even if they'll never admit it publicly. And every night when I close my eyes, I see that clearing. Chen hanging lifeless, Rodriguez's roar of defiance, and the creature's unblinking eyes staring out at us from the darkness. Rodriguez had been right. We were hunted, marked, survivors. No, we were the living dead, our lives reduced to a countdown to the next encounter with the unknown. And the nightmares? They never really end. You just learn to live with them, constant companions reminding you that the darkness is vast, and the monsters lurking within are very real. Sometimes I wonder if they put us on leave on purpose back then. Did they already know about the creature's tendencies? Were we an experiment all along? A test to see how long we would last? How much we could endure before we broke? Those thoughts are the most terrifying of all. They hint at a truth far more disturbing than any monster lurking in the woods. 
that the shadows we fight might just be a part of us, a darkness cultivated and unleashed by the very organization sworn to protect humanity. As I sit here, an old man now, I can't help but feel that my time is running out. The creature is patient, but it never forgets. One day, it will come for me, as it came for Chen and Rodriguez. And when it does, will anyone believe my story? Or will I simply become another mysterious disappearance, another tale whispered around campfires? Remember this, dear reader. The forests hold secrets darker than you can imagine. And sometimes, the real monsters aren't the ones hiding in the shadows, but the ones who send us to face them, knowing full well what awaits in the dark. My name is Walter Lee. What I'm about to tell you happened to me in September 2000, forever changing my life and my understanding of the world around us. Back then, I worked as a wildlife biologist in Yellowstone National Park, a job I had held for over two decades. Most days were filled with data tracking, trail maintenance, and other routine tasks that came with studying and preserving one of America's most cherished natural wonders. But there's a wildness to Yellowstone that seeps into your bones, a sense of something vast and untamed, and watching, always watching. It started with the mauled carcasses, elk mostly, but also the occasional bison or moose. The way they were taken down wasn't right, not wolves, not bears. Something else entirely, something that left even the most seasoned park rangers scratching their heads and muttering under their breath about things as old as the park itself. Whispers reached my ears, stories told by campers on the fringes of the park, of glimpses of something massive moving through the trees. They dismissed them as tall tales fueled by too many nights by the campfire and too much whiskey. Yet, standing alone in the dense forest we locals called Obsidian Forest, surrounded by the mutilated remains of creatures I thought I knew, I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. Then came the disappearances. A lone hiker on a backcountry trail vanished without a trace. Then two more. The official statement from the park was animal attacks, but the lack of any remains told a different story. Panic spread, and my quiet job suddenly thrust me into the heart of a full-blown manhunt. Word must have gotten up the chain, because one morning, a government jeep pulled up to my cabin. Inside were two men who didn't bother with Park Service uniforms. Their names were Mason and Reeves, and they cut to the chase. They were part of a special team brought in to handle the disappearances, and they wanted me to guide them. For three days we traversed the wilderness. Mason, ex-military, all hard muscle and hard eyes. Reeves, a lean, nervous type, who was more at home hunched over computers than in the great outdoors. And me, suddenly thrust into a world I'd never imagined despite a lifetime spent in the wilds. We tracked the coordinates of the most recent disappearance. The hiker, a young woman named Emily, had been broadcasting her location via a tracking app. Her trail ended abruptly at the base of a dense overgrown valley known to the locals as Dead Man's Gulch. It had an ominous ring for a reason. Old timers claimed anyone who wandered in there didn't come out. The terrain was brutal, strewn with fallen trees and dense thickets. The GPS led us to a trampled campsite. Emily's pack lay torn open, but there was no sign of blood, no struggle. I led them deeper into the gulch, my steps hesitant. The air seemed to grow thicker, heavier, and an unnatural silence pressed in around us. Suddenly, Reeves shouted, pointing ahead. Wedged between two rocks was Emily's phone, crushed but still functional. He held it up, the cracked screen showing a blurry, pixelated image. The last thing the camera had captured before its destruction. We crowded close, our hearts pounding. The photo was grainy, half obscured by foliage. Yet it was enough to make our blood run cold. Staring back at us was no animal. It was a massive bipedal shape, impossibly tall, hunched in the shadows. It had long muscular limbs and a glint of eyes that burned with chilling intelligence. What the hell is that? Reeves hissed, his voice barely a whisper. Before anyone could answer, a scream echoed through the gulch. Not a human scream, but something deeper, wilder. There was only one source, Emily. She was still alive. We have to find her, I hissed. 
We charged into the undergrowth, following the sound. I caught glimpses of the creature through the trees. It moved with unnatural speed, more ape than man, but far larger than anything I'd ever encountered. The pursuit led us deeper into the heart of Dead Man's Gulch, the ground growing steeper, rockier. We reached a sheer cliff, and at its base, a cave entrance. On the ground outside was Emily's torn and bloody t-shirt. Mason made the call. We're going in. Fear twisted my guts, but a primal determination overrode it. We drew our weapons, flashlights cutting through the gloom of the cave. The air was thick with a humid, earthy stench. Each step forward felt like walking into a predator's den. Then a noise from deeper inside the cave, a low, guttural growl. It echoed back at us, multiplied, as if the creature knew we were here. We tensed, weapons raised. From the darkness, it launched itself at us, a blur of fur, teeth, and claws. Reeves screamed and fired his rifle blindly. The creature was upon us, its roar deafening in the confined space. Mason unleashed a volley of shots, striking the creature and driving it back. But as it retreated, it snatched up Reeves in its massive, clawed hand. Reeves screamed again, his cries cut short as the creature vanished back into the darkness with its prize. His rifle clattered to the cave floor. His flashlight rolled across the rocks, the beam trembling wildly before going dark. Reeves. Mason and I scrambled forward, but there was nothing in the darkness but an echoing silence. Fury surged through me. These things had been lurking in the park, preying on people, and now they had one of our own. Mason held up a hand, the universal sign to pause and listen. Silence hung in the air. Then, faintly, we heard a rustling a muffled whimper from deeper within the cave system. Mason nodded at me, his eyes grim beneath the low beam of his flashlight. We were going after Reeves. The cave tunnels wound downwards, the air growing denser, and the foul stench intensifying. We stalked forward, rifles raised, our flashlights cutting through the suffocating blackness. The whimpers grew louder, urging us on. Suddenly, we burst into a large, natural cavern, the ceiling studded with dimly luminescent rock formations. And there, chained to the far wall with thick metal chains, was Reeves. He was slumped in a corner, ragged breaths heaving from his chest. He was alive, but his eyes were vacant with terror. Before we could react, the creature reappeared, dropping from the ceiling in a flurry of darkness and claws. Mason opened fire, forcing it back. I sprinted towards Reeves, ignoring the enraged screeching, the glint of teeth. The chains were heavy, secured with a thick padlock. My fingers fumbled for my tool kit, desperately searching for the bolt cutters. Time seemed to stretch. Each tick of the second was a hammer blow to my nerves. The creature stalked closer, circling us. A single swipe of its claws would tear me apart. Mason kept it pinned with a relentless barrage of gunfire, forcing it back again and again. With a gasp of triumph, I snapped the padlock and the chains fell away. I half-dragged, half-carried Reeves as we made a desperate scramble back towards the cave entrance. The echoing gunshots and the creature's howls of rage fueled our flight. We burst back into the light of day, collapsing beside the cliff. Mason slammed the heavy stone that served as a makeshift door shut behind us, barring the entrance. Silence fell, save for our ragged breaths and Reeves' ragged sobs. We'd escaped, but at a terrible cost. I looked down at Dead Man's Gulch, now bathed in the soft glow of sunset. It felt like the wilderness itself was staring back accusingly. The aftermath was a whirlwind. More soldiers arrived, armed to the teeth. They sealed off the entire area. We were debriefed in a hastily erected field camp. Our descriptions of the creature met with stony-faced nods. It was clear they knew more than they were letting on. We never went back inside that cave. A week later, a controlled detonation was ordered. The muffled blast echoed through the valley, followed by an ominous silence. When I asked what they'd found, Mason just looked at me and said, We found enough. The incident was hushed up. The missing hikers were ruled as unfortunate wildlife encounters. No mention was made of the creature, of the cave, of Reeves. Officially, he never existed. For Mason and me, there was no going back to a normal life. We'd seen the shadows in the park, the things lurking beyond the flickering edges of civilization. We were recruited into a new unit, its existence hidden behind layers of government bureaucracy. We became hunters of the unknown,
tracking creatures most people dismissed as myth. They sent us into remote corners of the country, places where unexplained sightings and disappearances made the news, then were promptly forgotten. I faced horrors I never could have imagined, stared into eyes that hold no trace of humanity. It's a solitary life spent on the fringes of society. Mason jokes that we're the real monsters out there in the darkness. He's not entirely wrong. Sometimes I look in the mirror and don't recognize the man staring back at me. The worst part isn't the creatures we hunt. It's the knowledge of how much more lurks out there. The things the government knows about and keeps hidden. The world most people see is just a thin veneer. And beneath it, well, let's just say I don't tell campfire stories anymore. There's always a new trail to follow, some new mystery in the heart of forgotten wilderness. I tell myself I do this to protect people, but another part of me knows I'm searching for something. Absolution, maybe. Or perhaps deep down, part of me believes that one day I'll wander into some godforsaken corner of the world and find Reeves. Alive. Unlikely, I know. But out in the places where the wild things dwell, hope is a rare and precious thing. You have to cling to it. Or you might end up like the creatures you hunt. As I write this, I'm preparing for another mission. There have been reports of strange occurrences in a remote forest in the Pacific Northwest. Hikers going missing, bizarre animal behavior, and whispers of something ancient awakening in the depths of the woods. I don't know what we'll find there, but I know this. The shadows are growing longer, and the things that lurk in the dark are getting bolder. The line between myth and reality is blurring, and we're the only ones standing in the breach. If you're reading this, consider it a warning. The wilderness isn't just trees and animals. There are things out there, older than humanity, with appetites we can't comprehend. And they're watching us, always watching. So the next time you're in the great outdoors, and you feel that prickle on the back of your neck, that sense of being observed, trust your instincts. Because you never know what might be lurking just beyond the tree line, waiting for its chance to strike. As for me, I'll keep hunting. It's all I know now. And maybe, just maybe, one day I'll find the answers I'm looking for. Or maybe I'll disappear into the wilderness, becoming just another mystery for someone else to solve. Either way, the shadows of Obsidian Forest will always be with me. A constant reminder of the day I learned that some legends are all too real. My name is Robert Hartley. This is the story of what happened to me on October 12, 2000, an event that would forever change my life and challenge everything I thought I knew about the world around us. Most people think I retired from the military and now work security at some boring office park. It's a convenient cover, one that allows me to blend into the background of everyday life. The truth, however, is far more complex and terrifying. Let's just say that the things that give normal people nightmares are what I deal with on a daily basis. My job description includes confronting the unexplainable, the horrifying, and the downright impossible. The incident, as the higher-ups so clinically call it, started with what seemed like a routine missing person report in the remote wilderness of Shadow Valley. Nothing new there, or so we thought. Hikers get lost all the time. Drug addicts do stupid things in the woods. Accidents happen in the unforgiving terrain of the dense forest. But this time, something was different. This time, the local sheriff found something that sent ripples of unease through even the most hardened veterans of my organization. It was a scene straight out of a horror movie. A half-eaten camper. Their tent shredded like tissue paper. Blood spattered in places it had no business being. But the real kicker, the detail that turned this from a tragic accident into something far more sinister were the footprints. Three-toed impressions, massive in size, like nothing the sheriff had ever seen before. These weren't bear tracks, nor any known predator in the region. These belonged to something else entirely. My team got deployed three days later. There were five of us, each selected for our unique skills and our ability to handle situations that would send most people screaming into the night. First, there was me, Robert Hartley, team leader and veteran of countless missions that officially never happened. I've seen things that would turn a man's hair white overnight, 
and I've learned to trust my instincts above all else. Then there was Malik Johnson, our weapons expert. Malik was a genius when it came to firearms and explosives. He could probably make a tank out of toothpicks if you gave him enough time. His dark humor and unflappable demeanor were invaluable in tense situations. Elena Vasquez was our tracker. With a nose like a bloodhound and eyes that could spot a needle in a haystack, Elena could follow a trail that most would consider long cold. Her connection to nature bordered on the supernatural, and more than once, her instincts had saved our lives. Dr. Aidan Foster, or Doc, as we called him, was our medic and resident skeptic. A brilliant physician with experience in trauma surgery, Aidan always looked for the rational explanation first, but even he couldn't deny the evidence of his own eyes when confronted with the impossible. Finally, there was Chris Novak, our tech specialist. Fresh out of training and greener than spring grass, Chris was a prodigy when it came to the cutting-edge equipment we used. His enthusiasm was both endearing and occasionally dangerous, as he had yet to fully grasp the gravity of our work. We went in heavy, loaded with enough firepower to take down a small army. Our equipment made my first tour of duty look like we were fighting with sticks and stones. High-tech sensors, thermal imaging, satellite uplinks, we had it all. But as I would soon learn, sometimes all the technology in the world isn't enough when you're facing something truly unknown. The journey into Shadow Valley began on a crisp autumn morning. The forest was a riot of colors, leaves turning brilliant shades of red, orange, and gold. It would have been beautiful if not for the gnawing feeling in the pit of my stomach, the instinct honed by years of experience that told me something was terribly wrong. As we followed the trail left by the sheriff and his team, the trees seemed to close in around us, creating a natural cage that grew denser with each step. The first day turned up nothing but shredded foliage and the occasional unnerving silence that fell over the woods like a heavy blanket. That night, huddled around a small, carefully concealed fire, the true nature of our surroundings made itself known. The woods came alive with sounds that sent shivers down even my weathered spine, rustling leaves that moved against the wind, the snap of distant branches that echoed like gunshots in the stillness, and once, just once, a low, guttural growl that made even Malik turn white as a sheet. None of us slept well that night, taking turns on watch, our eyes straining against the darkness for any sign of movement. The shadows seemed to dance at the edge of our vision, playing tricks on our minds and fraying our nerves. Day two brought us to another campsite, or what was left of it. The scene was eerily similar to the first, a tent reduced to tatters, personal belongings scattered as if by an explosive force. Doc Foster, brave soul that he was, poked around the remains, calling out theories about rabid wildlife and mass hysteria. But I saw the doubt flicker in his eyes, the way he avoided looking directly into the shadows of the forest for too long. Elena worked her magic, piecing together the events that had transpired here. Her face grew more troubled with each passing minute as she traced the chaotic paths left behind by whatever had attacked the campsite. This doesn't make sense, she muttered, crouching to examine a set of prints. The footprints, they're inconsistent. Sometimes they're those three-toed tracks we saw before, but then they shift, almost like, like whatever made them was changing shape as it moved. A chill ran down my spine at her words. Shape-shifting creatures were the stuff of legends and campfire stories, not something we were equipped to deal with. But I pushed the thought aside, focusing on the facts we could confirm. As night fell for the second time, the atmosphere grew heavy with tension. We set up a perimeter, night vision goggles buzzing with an eerie green glow that turned the familiar forest into an alien landscape. Chris fiddled with the sensors, his young face creased with worry as he called out readings that made no sense. I'm getting zero electromagnetic activity, he said, tapping furiously at his tablet. It's like, like something's absorbing all the energy around us. That shouldn't be possible. Before I could respond, the air split with a shriek that could curdle blood. It was a sound that didn't belong in this world, a cry of rage and hunger that spoke to something primordial in our brains. Run, hide, survive, every instinct screamed at once. Chris went flying as something massive crashed through the trees. 
a blur of muscle and fury that moved faster than anything its size had a right to. I fired on instinct, my shots quickly joined by a chorus of gunfire from the rest of the team. The ground shook under the creature's weight as it circled us, testing our defenses. In the chaos of muzzle flashes and shouted orders, I caught glimpses of our attacker. It was built vaguely like a man, but twisted, its skin pulled tight over a frame that seemed to shift and flow like liquid metal. Two sharp bones protruded from its forearms, wickedly curved and gleaming in the darkness. But it was the eyes that haunted me. Glowing amber orbs filled with a savage intelligence and an all-consuming hunger. The creature snarled, revealing rows of jagged teeth that would put a shark to shame. It lunged forward, faster than we could track, and suddenly, Elena was screaming. A spray of blood painted her face as she went down, clutching at her mangled leg. Fall back, I roared, grabbing Elena and dragging her toward what little cover we had. Malik, covering fire. Doc, get ready to patch her up. We retreated in a hail of gunfire, the creature circling us with predatory patience. It knew it had the upper hand, toying with us like a cat with a mouse. In the chaos, I saw Chris fumbling with something in his pack, his eyes wide with fear and determination. I've got an idea, he shouted over the din of battle. If this thing is absorbing energy, maybe we can overload it. Before I could stop him, Chris pulled out a experimental device we'd been field testing, a miniature EMP generator designed to disable electronic systems. With shaking hands, he activated it, and for a moment, the world seemed to hold its breath. The effect was immediate and terrifying. The creature let out a shriek of pain or rage. It was impossible to tell which and its form began to warp and twist in ways that defied explanation. Limbs elongated and contracted, its skin rippling like water. And then, in a burst of light that left us all blinded, it simply vanished. For a long moment, we stood in stunned silence, the only sounds our ragged breathing and Elena's pained whimpers. Then, slowly, the normal sounds of the forest began to return, the rustle of leaves, the call of nightbirds, the distant howl of a wolf, what, what just happened? Malik asked, his voice barely above a whisper. I shook my head, unable to form words. In all my years of dealing with the unexplained, I had never encountered anything like this. Whatever that creature was, it wasn't just some unknown animal. It was something else entirely. Something that shouldn't exist in our world. We need to get out of here, I finally managed to say. Doc, how's Elena? Aiden looked up from where he was tending to Elena's leg his face grim. It's bad, but I've stopped the bleeding. She'll need proper medical attention soon, though. I nodded, my mind racing, as I tried to formulate a plan. We were deep in hostile territory, with an injured team member and God knows what else lurking in the shadows. Our mission had just gone from search and rescue to survival. All right, listen up, I said, gathering the team close. We're going to make for the extraction point. Malik, you're on point. Chris, I want you monitoring those sensors constantly. If that thing comes back, I want to know about it. Doc, you and I will help Elena. Let's move. As we began our long trek back to civilization, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The forest seemed alive in a way it hadn't before, every shadow potentially hiding another nightmare. And underneath it all was a growing certainty that what we had encountered was just the tip of the iceberg. Little did I know that this was just the beginning of a nightmare that would stretch on for years, challenging everything I thought I knew about reality itself. The journey out of Shadow Valley was a nightmare that seemed to stretch on forever. Every step was a battle against exhaustion, fear, and the growing certainty that we were being hunted. Elena's injury slowed our progress, but leaving her behind was never an option. We took turns carrying her, our muscles screaming in protest as we navigated the treacherous terrain. As we pushed on, the forest around us began to change in subtle, unsettling ways. Trees that we could have sworn weren't there before suddenly blocked our path. Clearings we remembered passing through had vanished, replaced by dense thickets that tore at our clothes and skin. It was as if the very landscape was conspiring against us, trying to keep us trapped in this green hell. On the third day of our retreat, we encountered something that shook us to our core. We stumbled upon a cabin that seemed to appear out of nowhere, 
its weathered wood and sagging roof a stark contrast to the wild forest around it. Under normal circumstances, we would have seen it as a refuge, a place to rest and regroup. But there was something off about it, a wrongness that set my teeth on edge. We should check it out, Malik suggested, his voice tight with exhaustion. Might find supplies, maybe a radio. I wanted to argue, to insist we keep moving, but the truth was we were running on fumes. Elena's condition was deteriorating, and we all needed rest. With great reluctance, I nodded my agreement. As we approached the cabin, the air grew thick and heavy, like wading through invisible syrup. Chris's equipment went haywire, screens flickering with impossible readings before dying completely. The silence that fell was absolute, not even the rustle of leaves or the call of birds to break it. The door creaked open at Malik's touch, swinging inward to reveal an interior that defied logic. The cabin, which had appeared small from the outside, opened into a vast, cavernous space. Shadows clung to the corners, writhing and pulsing as if alive and in the center of the room stood a figure that made my blood run cold. It was human in shape, but there any resemblance to humanity ended. Its skin was a patchwork of textures, scales, fur, and something that looked disturbingly like tree bark. Its face was a blank mask, featureless except for a mouth that split it from ear to ear, filled with needle-sharp teeth. Welcome, it said, its voice a discordant chorus of whispers and screams. We've been waiting for you. Before any of us could react, the world seemed to twist and warp around us. The walls of the cabin melted away, revealing a vast, alien landscape. The sky above was a swirling vortex of colors that hurt to look at, and the ground beneath our feet pulsed with an unsettling rhythm, as if we were standing on the surface of a giant, beating heart. What is this place? Doc Foster whispered, his skepticism finally shattered in the face of the impossible. The creature's mouth stretched into a grotesque parody of a smile. This is the truth behind your reality, it said. The world you know is but a thin veil, easily torn. We are the caretakers, the guardians of the spaces between. As it spoke, more shapes emerged from the shadows, twisted amalgamations of flesh and otherworldly matter. Some walked on too many legs, others floated on non-Euclidean geometries that hurt the mind to comprehend and all of them were focused on us, with an intensity that was terrifying in its alienness. You don't belong here, I managed to say, my voice sounding thin and weak in this impossible place. We're leaving, now. The creature's laugh was like breaking glass. Leave? Oh, Robert Hartley, you misunderstand. You were brought here for a purpose. Your world is changing, evolving. The barriers are thinning. We need intermediaries. With that word, a wave of psychic force slammed into us. I felt my mind being invaded, alien thoughts and impossible knowledge pouring in faster than I could process. Beside me, Elena screamed, her injured leg suddenly healed, but twisted into something inhuman. Chris collapsed, his body convulsing as it began to change, skin hardening into a chitinous shell. Through the haze of pain and confusion, I saw Malik raise his weapon, firing wildly at the creatures around us. The bullets passed through them harmlessly, leaving ripples in the air like stones dropped in a pond. Doc Foster was on his knees, hands clutched to his head, blood trickling from his eyes and ears. I fought against the intrusion in my mind, drawing on every ounce of training and willpower I possessed. We are not your puppets, I growled, reaching for the EMP device that had saved us before. If these things were energy-based, maybe... The leader of the creatures tilted its head, a gesture eerily reminiscent of curiosity. Brave but futile, it said. You cannot fight what you are becoming. As my fingers closed around the device, I felt a surge of something. Power. Knowledge. A connection to something vast and incomprehensible. For a moment I saw beyond the veil of reality, glimpsed the true nature of the universe in all its terrifying complexity. With the last of my strength, I activated the EMP. The world exploded in light and sound, a cacophony of impossible colors and dimensions collapsing in on themselves. I felt myself falling, tumbling through layers of reality, my body and mind stretched to the breaking point. When I opened my eyes, we were back in the forest. The ordinary, mundane, beautifully normal forest. My team lay around me, 
unconscious but breathing. As I struggled to my feet, I realized with a jolt that months had passed. Our clothes were tattered, our hair and beards grown long, and each of us bore strange alien markings on our skin, a reminder of what we had experienced. The extraction team found us three days later, half mad and babbling about impossible things. The official report labeled it a training accident, exposure and hallucinogenic plants explaining away our fantastic story. But I knew the truth. We all did. In the years that followed, each of us changed in subtle ways. Elena's leg, once mangled, now allowed her to run faster than any human should be able to. Chris's affinity for technology bordered on the supernatural, able to manipulate electronic systems with a mere thought. Doc Foster's medical skills took on an almost miraculous quality, able to heal injuries that should have been fatal. And me? I found myself plagued by visions, glimpses of other realities bleeding through into our world. I could sense the weak points, the places where the veil was thinnest. It became my mission, my obsession, to guard these points, to prevent further incursions from the beings we had encountered. The organization I worked for didn't believe my warnings, didn't want to accept the truth of what was out there. So I went rogue, gathering a team of like-minded individuals who had brushed against the impossible. We became the silent guardians, the thin line between our reality and the chaos that lurked beyond. As I sit here now, 65 years old and battle-scarred in ways that go beyond the physical, I can feel the change in the air. The barriers are growing thinner, the incursions more frequent. What we experienced in Shadow Valley was just the beginning. I've trained my replacements, passed on what knowledge I can, but I fear it won't be enough. The day is coming when the veil will tear completely and humanity will be forced to confront the true nature of reality. And when that day comes, God help us all. For now, I continue my vigil, watching, waiting, and preparing for the day when the shadows come alive once more. Because I've seen what lurks in the darkness between worlds, and I know that our nightmares are nothing compared to the horrors that await us. This is Robert Hartley, signing off. If you're reading this, stay vigilant. Question reality. And whatever you do, don't venture into the shadows unprepared. For in the battle between light and darkness, we are the last line of defense, and the night is always waiting to consume us all. My name is Ronald Young. What I'm about to tell you happened to me in the summer of 1980, deep in the heart of Blackwood Forest. It's a tale that has haunted me for over four decades, one that I've never dared to share until now. But as the twilight of my life approaches, I feel compelled to unburden myself of this terrible secret. Back then, I was working for the Parks Department, though my official title was far more ominous. Cryptozoological Containment Specialist. It's the kind of job that raises eyebrows at dinner parties, assuming you're foolish enough to mention it. The government isn't big on admitting that things like Bigfoot or werewolves exist, but when something goes bump in the night and starts leaving bodies, I'm the guy they call. That fateful summer, we were tracking something in Blackwood Forest. Whatever it was, it was big, messy, and hungry. Hikers had been vanishing for months, experienced outdoorsmen who knew those trails like the back of their hands. The strange part? We never found a trace. No bodies, no scraps of clothing, nothing. At first, we thought it might be a bear that had developed a taste for human flesh. But bears don't clean skeletons to the bone. On the morning I made contact, I was heading deeper into the woods to check a series of motion-activated cameras we'd set up. The midday sun filtered through the dense canopy, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. The air was thick with humidity, and the incessant buzzing of insects was almost deafening. By the time I reached the first camera, I was drenched in sweat, cursing the oppressive summer heat. And then, without warning, the buzzing stopped. One second it was a wall of sound, the next, dead silence. The birdsong died. The forest went still. That silence is what hunters and prey alike live by the quiet before the kill. Every instinct I had screamed at me to get the hell out of there. But I had a job to do. 
I kept moving, my senses on high alert. The smell hit me first. It was the unmistakable stench of rotting meat, sharp and heavy in the thick air. My pulse thundered in my ears, every crackle of leaves under my boots sounding like rifle fire. As I rounded a bend in the trail, I saw it. My first thought was that it must have been a deer, or maybe an elk. What was left of it was strewn across the path rib cage, picked clean, fur matted with blood. No predator I knew of could have done that. And then I saw the footprints. They weren't animal tracks. They were more like a man's, only far too big. The stride was impossibly long, and deep indentations in the earth suggested massive weight. My blood ran cold. Whatever made those tracks was nearby and still hungry. Then I heard it, a sickening crack from deeper in the trees. I froze, rifle raised, but it wasn't the snap of a twig underfoot. It was the sound of bone breaking. That's when I saw him. He moved with impossible speed, a blur of muscle and matted fur. He was built like a man, easily seven feet tall and impossibly broad. His face, God, his face. It was twisted, canine and cruel, with eyes glowing a fierce yellow in the dim light. A low growl echoed through the trees, almost human in its rage. He knew I was there. Instinct took over. I fired twice, the rifle barking against the silence, but the creature was already moving. It charged. I had a glimpse of claws flashing, the stench of hot breath, and then impact. I was flying backward, rifle knocked from my hands. Pain exploded in my side where his claws had raked. I hit the ground hard, gasping for air. He towered over me, a hulking shadow against the light. I fumbled for my sidearm, but it was futile. In that moment, I knew two things with absolute certainty. This was no animal, and I was about to die. I scrambled back, trying to put space between us. My eyes searched desperately for an escape route, but there was none. He took a step closer, growling, and that's when I noticed something odd. His focus wasn't solely on me. It flickered over my shoulder, back towards the cameras I had been sent to check. Whatever it was, it had him spooked. I seized the moment. I lunged to the side and bolted. Gunshots rang out from further down the trail. My team had arrived. The distraction bought me just enough time. The creature roared in fury, its attention torn. I scrambled into the thicket, adrenaline masking the searing pain in my side. I didn't look back. Heart pounding, I stumbled through the undergrowth, ignoring the branches tearing at my clothes and skin. The shouts of my team grew fainter, replaced by the guttural snarls of the creature giving chase or perhaps it was following them. The thought spurred me on. I knew those woods better than most, but sheer panic propelled me forward. I ran blindly, branches whipping my face until I tripped and tumbled down a steep embankment. Pain ripped through my ankle as I landed awkwardly, but I forced myself up, limping towards a familiar landmark, a creek snaking through the forest. Splashing into the icy water, I ignored the shock, fighting the current to wade upstream. The cold numbed my throbbing injuries, my mind focused on a single thought, create distance. After what felt like hours, I hauled myself onto the bank and collapsed, exhaustion washing over me. The creature couldn't have followed my scent through the water, could it? My respite was short-lived. Shots echoed downstream, followed by a terrifying roar that cut through the trees. My team was in trouble. Guilt and a desperate sense of responsibility gnawed at me. I had to do something. Drawing on every bit of remaining strength, I pushed myself back to my feet. My twisted ankle throbbed, but the woodsman in me took over. I knew of a ranger cabin a few miles north uphill. If I could reach it, there might be a radio, a chance for backup. The hike was an agonizing blur. My lungs burned, my vision swam, but sheer terror kept me going. Every rustle of leaves had me flinching, expecting the creature to burst from the undergrowth, but it never did. Finally, the cabin came into sight, a ramshackle blessing in the wilderness. Stumbling inside, I slammed the door and bolted it, my heart a frantic drum in my ears. The place reeked of dust and disuse. But the sight of a radio on the rickety table made hope surge through me. I fumbled with numb fingers, praying for a signal. Static crackled. Then a voice broke through. Red Fern, report! What the hell is going on out there? It was Morgan, our mission coordinator. Swallowing hard, I keyed the mic, voice trembling. Morgan, it got them. It, it's not an animal. We need extraction, ASAP. A stunned silence filled the airwaves. 
Then Morgan's voice came back, tight and professional. Negative, Redfern. Cleanup is en route. You are to remain on site and maintain radio contact. Cleanup? My skin prickled with dread. I knew what that meant. The government's solution to things that couldn't be explained was to sweep them under the rug. My team, any evidence of the creature, it would all disappear. They wouldn't even find bodies. That thing didn't leave scraps behind. I wanted to scream, to argue, but it was futile. The protocol was protocol. The best I could do was warn them. I described the creature in chilling detail, omitting any speculation on what it truly was. The response was chilling, noted. Cleanup will be advised. Remain in place. Help is on the way. The lie in those words stung. I wasn't an idiot. No help was coming for me either. As the sun began to set, I knew my time was running out. I used the cabin's meager supplies to barricade the doors and windows, but it felt pathetically futile. The creature would tear right through it when it returned, and it would return. The waiting was the worst part. Every creak of the old cabin made me jump. With the fading light, shadows seemed to writhe, playing tricks on my exhausted mind. Had I imagined the whole thing? My gashed side and throbbing ankle were grim reminders that the nightmare was all too real. The forest outside grew eerily quiet. Not even the crickets chirped. Then it came. The rhythmic thud of approaching footsteps shaking the cabin walls. It began to circle the cabin, its growls echoing through the night. It slammed against the door, making the flimsy wood groan. Each crash was a countdown, a reminder of my impending doom. I retreated to the furthest corner, huddling on the floor with the shotgun I'd found stashed under the cot. It brought little comfort. I knew it would barely slow that creature down. Resignation settled over me. I wouldn't be another missing person in the woods, another unsolved mystery. I'd make damn sure there was something left to find. Hours must have ticked by. The creature's assaults grew less frequent, replaced by an unnerving silence. My own breathing sounded deafening in the quiet. It was playing with me, just like a cat with a mouse. A cold realization struck. The silence wasn't a reprieve, it was a strategy. The creature was waiting for me to break, to make a desperate move. I was trapped, surrounded, outmatched. Then a different thought pierced the despair. They knew where I was. My radio signal was a beacon for the cleanup crew. While the creature toyed with me, they were closing in. That wasn't hope exactly, but it ignited a spark of defiance. I wasn't going down without a fight. I crept to the window, peeking through a gap in the boards. In the pale moonlight, I saw a line of dark figures converging on the cabin, not a rescue team black-suited operatives armed to the teeth. Clean up. They were here to sanitize the situation, to eliminate witnesses along with the evidence. That meant me. A bitter rage coursed through me. I'd played by their rules, done my damn job. And this was my reward a bullet in the back from my own side. The creature chose that moment to strike again. The door splintered inwards, showering me with debris. Its grotesque form filled the doorway, teeth bared in a snarl. In that instant, a twisted plan formed in my desperate mind. The operatives outside heard the commotion. Gunfire erupted, bullets peppering the cabin walls. The creature roared in pain and whipped around, momentarily distracted. Seizing the opportunity, I burst from cover. I sprinted for the tree line, ignoring the shouts of the startled operatives. Bullets whizzed past my ears, some close enough to sting. I wasn't sure if they were shooting at me or the creature that burst from the ruined doorway, chaos erupting behind me. The forest swallowed me up. I ran until my lungs threatened to burst, until the shouts and gunfire faded into the distance. I was a fugitive now, a liability the government would gladly erase. I didn't stop didn't dare look back. Eventually, exhaustion forced me to take cover, to hole up in a mossy hollow beneath a fallen tree. My body throbbed, my injuries screaming in protest. But rest was a luxury I couldn't afford. In the morning, I'd move again. Keep moving. Find a way off these mountains, a way to disappear. The creature was the least of my worries now. I lay there, staring up at the sliver of sky visible between the leaves, and finally let the tears come. I wept for my team, for the life I had lost, for the shattered belief that anyone would come for me if I fell. The aftermath of that day was as messy as it was inevitable. The official report would cite an animal attack, 
maybe a rogue bear with a taste for the dramatic. The creature, if its remains were ever found, would be dissected in some sterile government lab, its true nature buried under layers of red tape and official denials. As for me, Ronald Young, cryptozoological containment specialist, I effectively ceased to exist. I became a ghost, a whisper in the wind. I survived by living in the shadows, taking odd jobs under assumed names, always one step ahead of the hunters I knew would forever be on my trail. Some nights, lying awake in a rundown motel room or under the vast expanse of the open sky, I think back to that cabin, that terrible night. I see the creature's blazing eyes and taste the copper tang of fear. But what haunts me most is the memory of those black-suited figures, their cold indifference, the realization that the true monsters sometimes wear tailored suits and speak in hushed tones behind closed doors. In the years since, I've heard whispers, rumors of other incidents, of things that shouldn't exist stalking the dark corners of our world. I've seen the fear in the eyes of those who know the truth, the desperation of those trying to expose it. But I've learned to keep my head down, to blend in with the shadows, because I know the truth now. The creatures that lurk in the darkness, the ones that prey on the unsuspecting, they're real. But they're not the most dangerous things out there. The real threat comes from those who would keep these secrets hidden, who would sacrifice anything or anyone to maintain their illusion of control. As I near the end of my life, I find myself wondering if I made the right choice all those years ago. Should I have stayed and fought? Should I have tried to expose the truth? But then I remember the cold efficiency of those cleanup crews, the ruthlessness with which they operated, and I know that silence was my only real option. So I leave you with this warning, dear reader. The world is not what you think it is. There are shadows within shadows, truths buried so deep that bringing them to light might destroy everything we hold dear. And if you ever find yourself face to face with something that shouldn't exist, something that defies explanation, run run and never look back because once you've seen behind the curtain there's no going back the monsters are real and they're always watching always waiting and sometimes the most terrifying thing of all is realizing that the real monster might be the one wearing your face in the mirror I never thought I'd be telling this story. Even now, as I sit here in the safety of my apartment, miles away from the wilderness that haunted my dreams for years, I can feel a chill creeping up my spine. But I need to get this out to put it down in words. Maybe then I can finally make sense of what happened to me in the shadow of Shadow Peak. My name is Ethan Blackwood, and this is my story. It was the fall of 2010, my junior year at Evergreen State University in Washington. I was 21, full of that invincible energy that only youth can bring. I'd grown up in the suburbs of Seattle, but I'd always felt a pull towards the wild. The concrete jungle never felt like home. I craved the scent of pine needles, the rush of mountain streams, the challenge of conquering untamed terrain. That's why when the opportunity arose to tackle a solo backpacking trip through the remote backcountry of Granite Gorge National Park, I jumped at the chance. Granite Gorge was legendary among hikers and outdoor enthusiasts, one of the last true wilderness areas in the lower 48 states. Its vast expanses of pristine forests, jagged peaks, and hidden valleys promise the ultimate test of skill and endurance. I spent months planning, poring over topographical maps, reading trail reports, and collecting gear. I talked to seasoned hikers, park rangers, and even a local wildlife biologist. By the time September rolled around, I felt as prepared as I could be. The first few days of my trek were everything I'd dreamed of, and more. The air was crisp and clean, filled with the scent of pine and wild herbs. Towering evergreens stretched as far as the eye could see, broken only by glittering alpine lakes and snow-capped peaks in the distance. I pushed myself hard, covering more ground each day than I'd initially planned. The solitude was intoxicating. For hours on end, the only sounds were my own footsteps and the occasional cry of a hawk overhead. 
On the evening of the third day, I made camp near the base of Shadow Peak, the park's most iconic mountain. Its jagged silhouette loomed against the darkening sky, a black cutout against a canvas of deepening purples and blues. As I sat by my small campfire, eating a meager dinner of trail mix and jerky, I felt a sense of unease creep over me. It was subtle at first, just a prickling sensation on the back of my neck, as if I were being watched. I scanned the tree line, but saw nothing out of the ordinary. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling. I told myself it was just fatigue, or maybe the natural wariness that comes from being alone in the wilderness. I crawled into my tent earlier than usual that night, zipping the flap tightly behind me. Sleep didn't come easily. The wind picked up, howling through the canyon with an almost human-like moan. Branches scraped against each other creating eerie creaking sounds that set my nerves on edge. When I finally drifted off, my dreams were filled with shadowy figures darting just out of sight, always retreating deeper into the forest when I tried to focus on them. I woke with a start just before dawn, my heart racing. For a moment, I couldn't remember where I was. Then it all came flooding back, the solo trip, Shadow Peak looming overhead. I unzipped the tent and peered outside, half expecting to see something. But there was nothing unusual, just the gray light of early morning filtering through the trees. As I packed up camp, I noticed something odd. The ground around my tent was disturbed, with what looked like large, misshapen footprints in the soft earth. They were bigger than any boot print I'd ever seen, and seemed to circle my campsite before leading off into the underbrush. A chill ran down my spine, but I forced myself to be rational. It was probably just an animal, maybe a bear or a mountain lion investigating my camp during the night. I set off early, eager to put some distance between myself and Shadow Peak. The trail wound higher into the mountains, becoming steeper and more challenging with each passing mile. By midday, the weather had taken a turn for the worse. Dark clouds rolled in, bringing with them a biting wind and the first few flakes of snow. I knew there was a chance of early snow in the forecast but I hadn't expected it to hit this soon or this hard. Within an hour, several inches had accumulated on the ground, obscuring the trail and making each step treacherous. I consulted my map, looking for a shortcut back to lower elevations. There was an old, rarely used trail that cut through a narrow pass. It would shave a full day off my return journey, but it was steeper and less maintained than the main route. As I stood there, weighing my options, I heard a sound that made my blood run cold. It was a low, rumbling growl, unlike anything I'd ever heard before. It seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once, reverberating through the trees and echoing off the rocky cliffs above. I spun around, searching for the source, but saw nothing but swirling snow and dense forest. My heart pounding, I made a split-second decision. I veered off onto the shortcut trail figuring that getting out of the high country as quickly as possible was my best bet. The path was barely visible beneath the snow, and I had to rely heavily on my map and compass to stay on course. As I pushed on, the storm intensified. The wind howled, driving the snow horizontally and reducing visibility to mere feet. I was so focused on simply putting one foot in front of the other that I almost missed the movement off to my left. Something large and dark flitted between the trees, just at the edge of my vision, I stopped, squinting through the curtain of white. For a moment, everything was still. Then I saw it again, a massive shape, easily seven or eight feet tall, moving with surprising grace for its size. It was covered in thick, dark fur, and even through the blinding snow, I could make out the gleam of yellow-green eyes fixed directly on me. I stood frozen, my mind refusing to process what I was seeing. It couldn't be real. It had to be a trick of the light, a hallucination brought on by exhaustion and the harsh conditions. But deep down, I knew. This was no illusion. The creature took a step forward, emerging fully from the tree line. Its proportions were all wrong for a bear, the torso too barrel-shaped, the arms far too long. It walked upright on two powerful legs, swaying slightly with each step. My breath caught in my throat as I realized I was face to face with something that shouldn't exist outside of campfire stories and cryptozoology forums. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the Sentinel of Shadow Peak. For what felt like an eternity, we just stared at each other. 
I could hear my own ragged breathing, see the plumes of vapor forming in the frigid air. The creature tilted its head, studying me with an almost human-like curiosity. Then, without warning, it let out a bone-shaking roar that seemed to make the very ground tremble. I didn't think. I didn't plan. I just ran. I tore down the trail, my feet slipping and sliding on the snow-covered ground. Branches whipped at my face, leaving stinging cuts, but I barely noticed. All I could focus on was the sound of heavy footfalls behind me, gaining ground with each passing second. I risked a glance over my shoulder and immediately wished I hadn't. The creature was in full pursuit, covering ground with impossible speed. Its long arms swung at its sides, occasionally reaching out to grab at low-hanging branches, using them to propel itself forward even faster. My lungs burned, and my legs felt like lead, but pure adrenaline kept me moving. I veered off the trail, hoping to lose my pursuer in the denser undergrowth. It was a mistake. The terrain became treacherous, full of hidden drops and slippery rocks. I stumbled, nearly falling several times, but somehow managed to keep my footing. The sounds of pursuit seemed to fade slightly, and for a moment I dared to hope I might have lost it. Then I burst through a thick stand of pines and found myself teetering on the edge of a steep ravine. I windmilled my arms, desperately trying to regain my balance, but it was too late. I plummeted down the rocky slope, tumbling head over heels. Pain exploded through my body as I bounced off boulders and scraped against jagged outcroppings. When I finally came to a stop at the bottom, I lay there gasping, every inch of me screaming in agony. Through the haze of pain, I became aware of a new sound, the rush of water. I lifted my head, wincing at the effort, and saw that I'd landed near the bank of a swift-flowing river. The water was dark and choppy, swollen with melting snow from higher up in the mountains. I struggled to my feet, knowing I couldn't stay put. The creature would surely find a way down the ravine, and I was in no condition for another chase. With no other options, I made my way to the water's edge. The current looked dangerous, but it was my only chance. Taking a deep breath, I waded in. The shock of the icy water nearly took my breath away. I pushed forward, fighting against the pull of the river. When it became too deep to touch bottom, I started swimming, letting the current carry me downstream. I don't know how long I was in the water. Minutes stretched into what felt like hours as I struggled to keep my head above the surface. The cold sapped my strength, and more than once I thought I would succumb to exhaustion and slip beneath the waves. Just when I thought I couldn't go on any longer, I spotted a large fallen tree stretching partway across the river. With the last of my strength, I managed to grab onto one of its branches. I pulled myself onto the trunk, shivering uncontrollably. As I lay there, gasping for breath, I heard it again, that low, rumbling growl. I looked up to see the creature standing on the riverbank, not fifty yards away. It paced back and forth, those eerie eyes never leaving me. But it made no move to enter the water. We stayed like that, locked in a stalemate, as the light began to fade from the sky. Eventually, the creature let out one final, mournful-sounding howl, then turned and loped back into the forest. I watched until it disappeared from view, then allowed myself to collapse fully onto the log. I must have passed out, because the next thing I knew, I was being lifted into a rescue helicopter. A search party had been dispatched when I failed to check in at my scheduled time. They found me, half-frozen and delirious, still clinging to that log in the middle of the river. In the days and weeks that followed, I tried to tell my story, but no one believed me. They chalked it up to hypothermia-induced hallucinations, or maybe an encounter with a particularly large bear. Even I began to doubt my own memories. Had it all been some vivid nightmare brought on by fear and exhaustion? But then, the dream started. Night after night, I found myself back in those woods, pursued by a shadowy figure that was always just out of sight. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, the echo of that bone-chilling growl ringing in my ears. I became obsessed with finding answers. I pored over old newspaper articles, interviewed locals, and scoured online forums dedicated to Bigfoot sightings. What I found both terrified and fascinated me. There were stories, going back generations, of a creature that roamed the wilderness around Shadow Peak. The Native American tribes of the area spoke of a forest guardian, 
a spirit that protected the land from those who would harm it. Early settlers told tales of a wild man that would throw rocks at their camps and leave massive footprints in the snow. More recently, there had been a string of mysterious disappearances in the park. Hikers who ventured off trail and were never seen again. Strange sounds in the night that couldn't be attributed to any known animal. And always, always, those unsettling reports of being watched by unseen eyes. The more I learned, the more certain I became that what I'd encountered was real. But I also began to see it in a different light. Was it truly the mindless monster I'd first believed it to be? Or was it something more complex, a sentient being, perhaps the last of its kind, trying to protect its home from human encroachment? I never returned to Granite Gorge. The memory of those yellow-green eyes and that ear-splitting roar was enough to keep me away. But I couldn't shake the pull of the wilderness entirely. These days I stick to well-traveled trails and always hike with a group. But sometimes, when the wind whispers through the trees just right, or when I catch a glimpse of movement at the edge of my vision, I wonder. Is it out there still, watching from the shadows? A guardian of the wild places? A living legend that defies explanation? I may never know for sure, but one thing is certain. My encounter on Shadow Peak changed me forever. It opened my eyes to the possibility that there are still mysteries in this world, things that exist beyond the realm of what we consider normal. And sometimes, late at night when sleep eludes me, I find myself listening. Listening for that low, rumbling growl that still echoes in my dreams. The call of the Sentinel of Shadow Peak. I knew I had to go back. I had to find out what was really going on in Everhart Forest. But I also knew I couldn't do it alone. That's when I decided to hire someone to accompany me. Someone with real outdoor experience who could help me navigate the wilderness. And hopefully, provide a witness to whatever we might encounter. That's how I met Ethan Reeves, a seasoned outdoorsman with years of experience guiding in some of the most remote parts of the country. When I first approached him about the job, I was vague about my true motivations, simply saying I wanted to explore some of the more isolated areas of Everhart Forest. Ethan was skeptical at first, but the promise of a generous paycheck eventually won him over. We spent weeks planning the expedition, gathering supplies, and poring over topographical maps of the area. I was determined to be better prepared this time, both mentally and physically. As the day of our departure drew near, I found myself filled with a mix of excitement and dread. Part of me hoped that we would find nothing, that my previous experience had been nothing more than an overactive imagination fueled by exhaustion. But another part of me, a part I was barely willing to acknowledge, hoped that we would find something, proof that I wasn't going mad, that there really was something out there in the shadows of Everhart Forest. Little did I know that the truth would be far more terrifying than anything I could have imagined. The morning of our departure dawned crisp and clear, a perfect autumn day that seemed to mock the tension coiled in my gut. Ethan arrived at my house just as the sun was peeking over the horizon, his battered pickup truck loaded with gear. Ready for this, Doc? he asked as he helped me load my own equipment into the truck bed. His tone was light, but I could see the questions in his eyes. He still didn't fully understand why a successful neurosurgeon would want to spend two weeks trekking through some of the most isolated parts of Everhart Forest. As ready as I'll ever be, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. I hadn't told Ethan the full story of my previous experience in the forest. I was afraid he'd think I was crazy and back out of the trip. But I had hinted at some of my concerns, framing them as rumors I'd heard about strange occurrences in the area. The drive to Everhart was mostly silent, each of us lost in our own thoughts. As we left the outskirts of Portland behind and the landscape transformed into dense forest, I felt a familiar prickle of unease creep up my spine. We parked at a remote trailhead, one that saw little use even during the peak hiking season. As we shouldered our heavy packs and prepared to set out, Ethan turned to me with a serious expression. Look, Doc, he said, his voice low. I know you're not telling me everything about why we're out here. I respect your privacy, but if there's anything I should know, anything that might affect our safety, now's the time to speak up. I hesitated, weighing my words carefully. Ethan, I... 
I saw something out here a few months ago, something I can't explain. I'm hoping this trip will help me make sense of it. His eyebrows rose slightly, but he didn't press for details. Instead, he simply nodded and said, All right, just remember, out here we watch each other's backs. No heroics, no wandering off alone, got it? I agreed, feeling a surge of gratitude for his professionalism. With that, we set off into the forest, the sounds of civilization fading behind us with each step. The first few days of our expedition were uneventful. We hiked deep into the heart of Everhart, following game trails and sometimes bushwhacking through dense underbrush. Ethan was a wealth of knowledge about the local flora and fauna, pointing out interesting plants and signs of animal activity. But as we drew closer to the area where I had my encounter months before, the atmosphere began to change. The forest seemed to grow quieter, the usual chatter of birds and small animals becoming noticeably absent. Even Ethan, with all his experience, commented on the unusual stillness. It's like the whole damn forest is holding its breath, he muttered one evening as we set up camp. Never seen anything quite like it. That night, as we sat around our small campfire, I finally told Ethan the full story of what I had experienced on my previous trip. To his credit, he listened without interruption, his face betraying no judgment or disbelief. When I finished, he was quiet for a long moment, staring into the flames. Finally, he spoke. I've been in these woods for most of my life, Doc. Seen things that most people wouldn't believe. But what you're describing, it's beyond anything I've ever encountered. Do you think I'm crazy? I asked, unable to keep the hint of desperation out of my voice. Ethan shook his head slowly. No, I don't think you're crazy, but I do think we need to be extra careful from here on out. Whatever's out there, if it's out there, it's not playing by any rules we understand. His words were far from comforting, but I appreciated his honesty. As we turned in for the night, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, just as I had felt months ago. The next few days were a blur of tension and hypervigilance. We pushed deeper into the forest, retracing my steps as best I could remember. The feeling of being observed grew stronger with each passing hour, and even Ethan, who had initially been skeptical, began to show signs of unease. It was on the fifth night of our expedition that things took a turn for the terrifying. We had made camp in a small clearing, not unlike the one where I had my first encounter. As we sat by the fire, Discussing our plans for the next day, a blood-curdling howl split the air. The sound was like nothing I had ever heard before. Not quite animal, not quite human, but something in between. It was filled with a kind of primal fury that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Ethan was on his feet in an instant, rifle in hand, peering into the darkness beyond our campfire. What the hell was that? He whispered, his voice tense. Before I could respond, Another howl echoed through the trees, closer this time. It was followed by a series of low, guttural grunts, the same sounds I had heard outside my tent months ago. Get in the tent, I hissed, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst from my chest. Now! We scrambled inside, zipping the tent flap closed behind us. The sound seemed deafening in the sudden silence that followed. We lay there, hardly daring to breathe, straining our ears for any sound of approach. The rest of the night was hellish. The grunts and howls circled our camp, sometimes drawing alarmingly close, only to fade away again. We could hear branches snapping, heavy footfalls moving through the underbrush. Whatever was out there, it was big, and there seemed to be more than one of them. By the time dawn broke, neither of us had slept a wink. We emerged from the tent cautiously, half expecting to find our camp destroyed, but everything was as we had left it, almost. There, in the soft earth around our campsite, were footprints. Huge, misshapen prints, exactly like the ones I had seen before. Ethan knelt to examine them, his face pale. Jesus, he muttered. What the hell made these? I shook my head, unable to form words. The reality of our situation was starting to sink in. We were deep in the wilderness, days from the nearest help, and something unknown, something potentially dangerous was stalking us. As we stood there, trying to process what was happening, a twig snapped in the forest behind us. We whirled around, Ethan raising his rifle, but there was nothing to see. 
just the endless sea of trees, their branches suddenly seeming more like grasping claws than peaceful boughs. We need to get out of here, Ethan said, his voice low and urgent. Now, I nodded, my mouth too dry to speak. We packed up camp in record time, constantly glancing over our shoulders, jumping at every sound. As we shouldered our packs and prepared to leave, I caught a flash of movement out of the corner of my eye. There, between two massive trees, I saw it, a hulking shape, taller than any man, with long arms that nearly brushed the ground. Its skin was a mottled gray-brown, like tree bark come to life. But it was the face that froze the blood in my veins. It was vaguely wolf-like, with an elongated snout and a wicked underbite that revealed rows of yellowed fangs. And the eyes? God, the eyes were almost human, filled with an intelligence that seemed at odds with its bestial form. Ethan, I whispered, my voice barely audible. Don't move. But it was too late. The creature's head snapped in our direction, its eerily human eyes locking onto us with predatory focus. For a heartbeat, time seemed to stand still. Then, with a bone-chilling roar, it burst from the trees, moving with a speed that defied its massive size. Run! Ethan shouted, raising his rifle and firing off a quick succession of shots. The sound was deafening in the close confines of the forest, and I saw the creature flinch as at least one bullet found its mark. But it didn't slow down. We turned and ran, crashing through the underbrush with no regard for direction or stealth. All that mattered was putting distance between us and that thing. I could hear it behind us, branches snapping and small trees practically exploding as it barreled through them in pursuit. My lungs were on fire, my legs leaden, but terror gave me strength I didn't know I possessed. Ethan was just ahead of me, pausing occasionally to fire back at our pursuer. Each shot seemed to enrage it further, its roars growing more frenzied. We burst out of the tree line into a small clearing, and for a moment I thought we might have a chance. But then my foot caught on an exposed root, and I went down hard, pain exploding in my ankle as it twisted beneath me. Marcus! Ethan yelled, skidding to a stop and turning back for me. No, keep going, I shouted back, trying to struggle to my feet, but it was too late. The creature exploded from the forest edge, its massive form blotting out the sun. Up close, the stench of it was overwhelming, a mixture of wet fur, rotting vegetation, and something metallic that made my stomach churn. Its lips pulled back in a grotesque approximation of a grin, revealing rows of yellowed teeth, each as long as my finger. Ethan fired again, the shot going wide in his panic. The creature's head whipped towards him, a low growl rumbling from its chest. It was going to go for him, I realized with horror. Without thinking, I grabbed a rock from the ground near me and hurled it at the beast's head. Hey, over here, you oversized furball, I yelled, my voice cracking with fear. It worked. The creature's attention snapped back to me, its eyes narrowing with what I could swear was irritation. As it took a step towards me, Ethan fired again. This time, his aim was true. The creature jerked as the bullet struck its shoulder, a spray of dark blood staining its mottled fur. It roared in pain and fury, torn between its two tormentors. That moment of indecision was all we needed. Ethan rushed to my side, hauling me to my feet. I bit back a cry of pain as I put weight on my injured ankle. Come on, Ethan grunted, supporting much of my weight as we staggered towards the tree line on the far side of the clearing. We need to find somewhere defensible. Behind us, the creature's roars turned to pained whimpers, then to silence. I didn't dare look back to see if it was following. We pushed on through the forest, my ankle screaming in protest with every step. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes, we stumbled upon an old, gnarled tree with a hollow large enough for us to squeeze into. Ethan helped me inside, then crawled in after me, his rifle pointed out at the forest. We sat there in silence, our ragged breathing sounding impossibly loud in the quiet of the woods. My mind was reeling, trying to process what we had just seen. It was impossible, and yet... What? What was that thing? I finally managed to whisper. Ethan shook his head, his eyes never leaving the forest outside our hiding spot. I don't know, Doc. In all my years in these woods, I've never seen anything like it. Never even heard stories of anything like it. As the adrenaline began to wear off, the pain in my ankle intensified. I gritted my teeth, 
trying to examine it in the dim light of our hollow. It was swollen and starting to bruise, but I didn't think it was broken. Just a bad sprain, hopefully. We need to get out of here, I said, stating the obvious. Get back to civilization and report this to... someone. Ethan nodded grimly. Yeah, but we can't move yet. That thing could still be out there waiting for us, and you're in no shape for a quick getaway. He paused, then added, Besides, who would believe us? We'd sound like a couple of lunatics. He had a point. Even having seen it with my own eyes, I was having trouble believing it was real. How could something like that exist without anyone knowing about it? And yet, the missing person's reports, the strange sightings over the years. Maybe people did know, in a way. Maybe they just didn't want to believe. We spent a tense night in that hollow, taking turns keeping watch. Every sound, every shadow made us jump. But nothing came for us. As dawn broke, we cautiously emerged from our hiding spot. The forest seemed different somehow, more sinister. The very air felt heavy with menace. Ethan helped me fashion a crude crutch from a forked branch, and we began the long, arduous journey back towards civilization. We moved as quickly as my injury would allow, constantly looking over our shoulders, starting at every snapping twig or rustling leaf. It took us three days to reach the trailhead where we had left Ethan's truck. Three days of pure, unadulterated terror. We heard the creature, or others like it, several times. Always at night, always at a distance. But the howls and grunts were unmistakable. We didn't see it again, but the feeling of being watched never left us. When we finally reached Ethan's truck, we both nearly wept with relief. As we drove back towards Portland, the tension slowly began to ease but neither of us could shake the feeling that our ordeal wasn't truly over. What do we do now? Ethan asked as we neared the city limits. I thought for a long moment before answering. We need to tell someone. The Forest Service, maybe? Or, or what? The tabloids? Ethan snorted. Face it, Doc. No one's going to believe us. Hell, I was there, and I'm not sure I believe it. He was right, of course. But I couldn't just let it go. People were still going into those woods unaware of the danger lurking in the shadows. And what if those creatures decided to venture out of the forest? The thought sent a chill down my spine. We need proof, I said slowly, the beginnings of a plan forming in my mind. Photos, video evidence, something concrete that people can't dismiss. Ethan looked at me like I'd grown a second head. You want to go back, after what we just went through? I nodded grimly. We have to. We're the only ones who know what's out there. We have a responsibility. Ethan was quiet for a long time. Finally, he sighed. You're crazy, you know that? But you're right. We can't just pretend this didn't happen. If we don't do something, more people could get hurt, or worse. And so, as we drove back into Portland, we began to plan our return to Everhart Forest. We would be better prepared next time, better equipped. We would bring cameras, traps, whatever we needed to gather evidence. But deep down, I knew that no amount of preparation could truly ready us for what awaited in the shadows of Everhart Forest. The creatures we had encountered defied explanation, defied reality itself, and I had a sinking feeling that our next encounter with them might be our last. As we parted ways, Ethan to his home and me to mine, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were now part of something much bigger than ourselves. Something ancient and terrifying that had been hiding in the wilderness for who knows how long. I looked back at the distant silhouette of the forest on the horizon. Somewhere in those trees, something was waiting, watching. And I knew, with a certainty that chilled me to my core, that this was only the beginning of our nightmare. Weeks passed, but the memory of our encounter in Everhart Forest haunted my every waking moment. I threw myself into research poring over old newspapers, folklore, and scientific journals, searching for any hint of similar creatures. Ethan, meanwhile, focused on gathering equipment for our return journey. We met regularly, planning our expedition down to the smallest detail. Elena, my wife, knew something was wrong. I couldn't hide the nightmares that jolted me awake, drenched in sweat, nearly every night. But I couldn't bring myself to tell her the truth. How could I explain something I barely understood myself? Finally, after two months of preparation, we were ready. We told our families we were going on a wildlife photography expedition. 
not entirely a lie, given our intent to capture evidence of the creatures. This time, we were armed with high-tech cameras, motion sensors, and even a small drone. Ethan had also insisted on bringing more firepower, just in case. As we drove back towards Everhart Forest, a heavy silence hung between us. We both knew the risks, knew that we might not come back from this trip. But the need for answers, for validation of what we'd experienced, drove us forward. We parked at a different trailhead this time, one closer to where we'd had our encounter. The forest seemed to loom over us, darker and more forbidding than I remembered. As we shouldered our packs and checked our weapons one last time, Ethan turned to me. Last chance to back out, Doc, he said, his voice gruff but tinged with concern. I shook my head. We need to do this, Ethan, for ourselves and for anyone else who might stumble into danger out here. He nodded, and without another word, we set off into the woods. The first few days were uneventful. We set up camera traps, took soil samples from areas with strange tracks, and used the drone to survey the forest canopy. But we saw no sign of the creatures. The forest was quiet, too quiet. No birds sang, no small animals scurried through the underbrush. It was as if the entire ecosystem was holding its breath. On the fourth night, everything changed. We were huddled around our small campfire when one of our proximity alarms went off. Something had triggered a motion sensor nearly a mile from our camp. We sprang into action, grabbing our gear and heading towards the alarm's location. As we drew closer, we could hear strange, guttural noises echoing through the trees. My heart pounded in my chest, a mixture of fear and anticipation coursing through me. We crept forward, using the cover of darkness and dense foliage to our advantage. And then we saw them. In a small clearing, illuminated by the pale moonlight, were three of the creatures. They were even more terrifying than I remembered. Massive, primordial things that seemed to bridge the gap between man and beast. They appeared to be feeding on something, their powerful jaws tearing into flesh with sickening efficiency. Ethan raised his camera, the soft click of the shutter barely audible over the sounds of the creature's feast. I fumbled with my own camera, my hands shaking as I tried to focus. Suddenly, one of the creatures stiffened, it raised its head, its nostrils flaring as it scented the air. With a low growl, it turned in our direction. Run, Ethan whispered urgently. Now! We turned and fled, crashing through the underbrush with little regard for stealth. Behind us, we could hear the creatures giving chase, their howls of fury echoing through the night. We ran for what felt like hours, the sounds of pursuit never far behind. Just when I thought my lungs would burst, we burst out of the tree line onto a steep cliff overlooking a river far below. We're trapped, I gasped, panic rising in my throat. Ethan looked around wildly, then pointed to a narrow ledge leading along the cliff face. There, it's our only chance. We inched along the ledge, our backs pressed against the cold stone of the cliff. The roars of the creatures grew closer, and I dared a glance back. They were at the tree line, pacing back and forth, seemingly unwilling to leave the cover of the forest. Just as I began to hope we might escape, the ledge beneath my feet crumbled. I felt myself falling, a scream torn from my throat. Ethan's hand shot out, grasping my wrist in an iron grip. Hold on, he shouted, straining to pull me up. For a moment I hung there, suspended between salvation and the abyss below. Then, with a Herculean effort, Ethan hauled me back onto the ledge. We continued on, finally reaching a point where the cliff sloped down to meet the riverbank. We half ran, half slid down to the water's edge, then plunged into the icy current. The river carried us swiftly away from the forest and the horrors it contained. When we finally dragged ourselves onto the opposite bank miles downstream, the first light of dawn was breaking over the horizon. We were battered, exhausted, and half drowned, but we were alive, and more importantly, we had evidence. Ethan's camera, protected in a waterproof case, contained clear images of the creatures. The aftermath of our expedition was a whirlwind. We took our evidence to the authorities, to scientists, to anyone who would listen. At first, we were met with skepticism and disbelief. But as more experts examined our photos and samples, the truth became undeniable. The scientific community was thrown into an uproar. Cryptozoologists hailed it as the discovery of the century. 
Government agencies scrambled to contain the situation, cordoning off large sections of Everhart Forest for environmental studies. As for Ethan and me, we became reluctant celebrities. There were interviews, book deals, even talk of a movie. But the nightmares never stopped. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those creatures, their two human eyes filled with primal hunger. Years have passed since our discovery shook the world. Everhart Forest is now a restricted area, subject to intense scientific study. There have been other sightings, other encounters, but nothing as close or as harrowing as what Ethan and I experienced. Sometimes, on sleepless nights, I find myself drawn to the window, staring out at the distant silhouette of the forest on the horizon. And I wonder, did we do the right thing in exposing the truth, or are there some secrets that are better left hidden in the shadows? One thing I know for certain, the world is a stranger, more dangerous place than most people realize. There are things out there, ancient and powerful, that defy our understanding of reality. And sometimes, the greatest horror isn't in discovering these truths, but in realizing that we can never unknow them. As I stand here, watching the sun set behind Everhart Forest, I can't shake the feeling that this isn't over. Somewhere in those trees, something is watching, waiting. And I fear that one day it might decide to step out of the shadows and into our world. But until that day comes, I'll be here, standing guard at the edge of the known, ready to face whatever emerges from the darkness of Everhart Forest. It was 1953, and I'd hiked up into the rugged Cascade Mountains of Washington for some solitude and the crisp air you can only find at altitude. I'm Jack Hawkins, a veteran of the Korean War, and back then, the outdoors was the only place that quieted my demons. The war had left its mark on me, both physically and mentally, and I found solace in the vast wilderness that seemed untouched by the horrors of human conflict. My first day in the mountains was uneventful filled with the kind of peace that comes from isolation and physical exertion. I did a nice long loop, feeling at ease despite the gnaw of old war wounds acting up. The cool mountain air filled my lungs, and for a moment I could almost forget the nightmares that plagued me back in the city. It was on the second day that things began to change. I spotted the tracks early in the morning, just as the sun was beginning to peek over the jagged peaks. They were big unlike anything I'd seen before. At first, I tried to rationalize them, maybe a bear or some local with unusually large feet and poor choice in footwear. But as I continued my hike, something about those tracks set off alarm bells in my head. The toe spacing was too wide, the heel marks strangely deep, and they kept cropping up, paralleling my path with an eerie precision. It didn't take long for the realization to sink in. Someone, or something, was following me. Now, I wasn't the jumpy sort. I'd seen and done things during the war that would make most folks crumble. But being stalked out here, miles from civilization, it was unsettling in a way that made my skin crawl. I found myself constantly glancing back over my shoulder, half expecting to catch a glimpse of whoever was leaving those tracks. But there was nothing, just trees, rocks, and that unnerving quiet of the high country. By the afternoon, I'd had enough. The constant feeling of being watched was wearing on my nerves, bringing back memories of jungle warfare that I'd rather forget. I decided to try and shake my stalker to see if I could get a fix on them. Taking a sharp turn off the trail, I ducked into a dense grove of pines, crouching low and listening hard. For a long moment, there was nothing but bird calls and the wind in the branches. Then I heard it, a grunt, low and rough, and way too close for comfort. I whipped my head around, and that's when I saw it. Just twenty feet away, partially hidden in the shadows, something big was watching me. At first, all I could register was its size. It was enormous, easily topping seven feet. Then the details hit me, and I felt my blood turn to ice in my veins. The creature had a hunched form, with arms disproportionately long and covered in thick, dark fur. Its head was... Christ, it looked almost wolf-like, but the jaw jutted out further filled with a mess of teeth below cold yellow eyes that gleamed with an unnatural intelligence. Terror gripped me, but the survival instinct hammered into me by years of combat kicked in. I eased backward, 
my rifle half-raised, trying to keep my movement slow and non-threatening. The creature stayed still, just watching, its head tilting in an unnervingly curious way. What do you want? I managed to croak out, my voice barely above a whisper. No answer came, just that unblinking stare that seemed to bore right through me. Then the creature moved. It wasn't a charge, thank God, but it padded out from the trees with a fluid quickness that chilled my blood. It dropped to all fours, massive knuckles brushing the ground. That's when the full reality of the situation hit me like a freight train. This wasn't some elaborate prank or a man in a costume. No human, even a big one, moved with that kind of animalistic wrongness. I stumbled backward, fumbling with my rifle, desperate to put some distance between myself and this impossible beast. I lined up a shot, squeezing the trigger with trembling fingers. Click. The damn thing jammed. Panic surged through me as the creature picked up speed, trotting toward me with predatory intent. I had to work the bolt, chamber around, and fast. My hands were shaking, cold sweat prickling my forehead as I fought with the stubborn mechanism. That's when I saw them. More figures were emerging from the trees. Three of them, all the same as the first, moving in a loose, circling pattern. The cold realization flooded through me. This wasn't a lone encounter. I was cornered prey to a whole damn pack of these things. With a shaking hand, I finally cleared the jam and levered the rifle up. The nearest creature was impossibly close now, its hot, rancid breath reaching me in waves that made my stomach churn. There was no time to think, only to act. I fired one shot, then another in quick succession. One of the creatures gave an unearthly howl, clutching at its leg where my bullet had found its mark. But I didn't stick around to see if it went down. I turned and ran, tearing back towards the trail, my heart thudding like a war drum in my chest. Behind me I could hear their furious bellows, the pounding of heavy paws on the forest floor. They would be faster on their own territory, I knew. Each crack of a twig sounded like a gunshot, making me jumpy and desperate as I crashed through the underbrush. I burst out of the trees onto the open trail, my lungs burning with every ragged breath. Just ahead I spotted a couple hiking, their faces bright with that friendly openness of outdoors folk. They hadn't heard the commotion yet, hadn't seen the monstrous things that were about to come tearing out of the forest in pursuit. For a moment I skidded to a halt, every ounce of self-preservation battling my ingrained sense of decency. Yelling would just draw those, those things closer to the unsuspecting hikers. No, I needed to buy time to lead my monstrous pursuers away. Run, I shouted at the startled couple, hoping my terror-widened eyes would telegraph the urgency that words couldn't convey. Get back the way you came. Confusion flickered on their faces for a split second. Then the man, bless his heart, snapped into action. Come on, honey, let's move, he said, ushering the woman along the trail, retreating away from the sounds of the approaching chase. Heart hammering in my throat, I plunged off to the side, back into the unforgiving trees. The howls were closer now, echoing with a blood-chilling fury that made my skin crawl. I ran blindly, branches whipping my face, stones rolling treacherously beneath my boots. The terrain grew steeper, harder to navigate at speed, but fear drove me onward. My lungs screamed for mercy, but I didn't dare stop. Stumbling, I broke through a line of pines and found myself on a sheer ledge, overlooking a fast-flowing creek far below. I'd run out of options. There was nowhere left to go, with maybe thirty feet of empty air between me and that rushing water. Behind me, the cracking undergrowth heralded my pursuers drawing near. Three of those creatures burst from the tree line, slowing down as they surveyed the terrain. I backed toward the precipice, eyes flicking between them, my rifle clenched in white-knuckled hands. They fanned out, cutting off any hope of escape. The leader, the one I'd wounded earlier, snarled, showing a mouthful of yellow blood-streaked teeth. They stalked closer, a horrifying parody of a hunting pack closing in for the kill. I raised my rifle, more of a desperate gesture than a real threat at this point. They were close enough now that I could smell them. That rank animal stink mingled with something copper-sharp that I recognized all too well from the battlefield. The scent of fresh blood. I fired another shot, the bullet kicking up dirt beside them. It only seemed to goad them further, their yellow eyes gleaming with a primal hunger that made my blood run cold. A twig snapped behind me. I whipped around, and my heart sank even further. 
The fourth one had outflanked me, now crouched between me and any route back into the relative safety of the trees. I was truly trapped, with no way out, but despair threatened to swallow me whole. I'd fought in a war, seen the worst that men could do to one another. But this was different. This was a primal, bone-deep dread that transcended reason, that whispered of ancient terrors and things best left forgotten in the dark corners of the world. The leader tensed, muscles bunching beneath its matted fur as it prepared to pounce. That's when I made my choice. Rather than be torn apart by those nightmare claws and teeth, I'd hurl myself down to the rocks and the mercy of the creek below. I turned, took a step towards the edge, and then something unexpected happened. A gunshot cracked out, followed by another in quick succession. Shouts of alarm rang through the air, and the lead creature yelped in pain. I spun back around to see a spray of red marking its shoulder where the bullet had found its mark. More shots echoed through the trees, and the creatures, clearly spooked by this unseen attack, whirled and bolted back into the tree line. Confused and half expecting to wake up from some fever dream, I stood frozen for a moment, unable to process this sudden turn of events. Salvation, it seemed, wasn't coming in the form of a leaping plunge to my death after all. I cautiously made my way back from the ledge, rifle still raised, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst from my chest. Then, two figures emerged from the undergrowth below. A park ranger and a grizzled hunter, both men bearing weapons, their faces etched with a wariness that spoke of years in these mountains. We heard the shots, the ranger said, his eyes scanning the area for further threats. Figured someone was in trouble. Relief washed over me so strong that I nearly buckled where I stood. I sputtered out something about monsters, about the creatures that had been hunting me. The two men exchanged a loaded glance, and I half expected to see disbelief in their eyes. But the ranger's gaze held a flicker of... Was it acknowledgement? We found nothing but the creature's blood and those huge, inhuman tracks retracing their path back into the wilderness. I described what I'd seen, my voice shaking as I recounted the impossible horror of it all. The men didn't laugh or dismiss me as some city boy gone mad in the mountains. Instead, the hunter gave me a long, assessing look before speaking. Skinwalkers, he said finally, his voice low and gravelly. Old stories talk about them. Things that ain't fully man or animal. Thought they were just campfire tales to scare the kids, but... I knew then, in that moment, the true horror of what stalked those mountains. The ranger made his official report, of course. Put it down to a bear attack or maybe a hallucination brought on by altitude sickness. But I saw the look in his eyes. He knew, just as I did, that there were things in these mountains that defied explanation. The aftermath was a blur. There were interviews, insistent warnings about hiking alone in the backcountry, and always those quiet sidelong glances from people who saw me as either a lucky survivor or a raving madman. I never went back to the Cascades after that. The crisp mountain air that once held such appeal now only carries the memory of terror. These days I stick to the city. But even here, surrounded by the comforting hum of civilization, I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. Sometimes, looking into the shadows between buildings or the darkness beyond the glow of streetlights, I swear I see those yellow eyes staring back. They didn't kill me that day, those monstrous things. But they killed something in me. The belief in the neat divisions between man and animal, between the known and the unknown, that part of me is gone, torn away like flesh from bone. I keep that old rifle loaded even now, Sometimes I think they know, that they're out there somewhere, biding their time just like they did on that mountain. Maybe one day my luck will run out, and they'll come to finish the hunt they started all those years ago. I'll go down fighting, that much I promise. But damn it all, I never asked to be prey. And in the dark of night, when the wind howls and shadows seem to move of their own accord, I wonder, how many others have they hunted? How many weren't as lucky as I was? The world is a darker place now, full of terrors that most people can't even imagine. But I know they're out there. And sometimes, in my darkest moments, I think they know that I know. Waiting, watching, hungry. And all I can do is keep my eyes open, my rifle close, 
and pray that the hunt truly is over. The year was 2005, and I was finally embarking on the cross-country road trip I'd always dreamed of, though definitely not under the circumstances I'd imagined. My name's Marcus, by the way, and a few months earlier, my world had shattered. My wife Elena, killed in a tragic hiking accident, completely out of the blue, left me struggling to figure out what the hell to do with my life now. My brother Ethan suggested I get away for a while, let my head clear. He offered up his old Chevy van and his company, and well, I figured it couldn't hurt. Maybe a change of scenery would help me make sense of things. We decided to head out towards the Midwest. Wisconsin sounded like a good target. We figured we'd work our way east, hitting up all the state parks along the way. First stop, Devil's Lake State Park. As we pulled into the parking lot, the sun was setting, casting an eerie orange glow over the landscape. The lake stretched out before us, dark and still, reflecting the looming bluffs like a mirror. Perfect if you're trying to forget your troubles, I thought bitterly. Well, we made it, Ethan said, stretching as he climbed out of the van. Want to set up camp? I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. The lump in my throat had been a constant companion since Elena's death, and sometimes it felt like I'd never be able to talk normally again. We pitched our tent in silence the only sounds the rustling of leaves and the occasional call of a night bird. As darkness fell, we sat around a small campfire, the flames casting flickering shadows across our faces. You want to talk about it? Ethan asked softly. I shook my head. Not really. He sighed, but didn't push it. That was one thing I appreciated about Ethan. He knew when to back off. As the fire died down, we retreated to our tent. I lay awake for hours, staring at the canvas ceiling. Memories of Elena flooding my mind, her laugh, her smile, the way her eyes crinkled when she was concentrating, the sound of her scream as she fell. I must have dozed off eventually because the next thing I knew, I was jolted awake by a blood-curdling howl. I sat bolt upright, heart pounding. Ethan, I hissed, reaching out to shake my brother awake. Did you hear that? Ethan groaned and rolled over. Hear what? As if in answer the howl came again, longer this time, rising to a pitch that sent shivers down my spine. It didn't sound like any animal I'd ever heard before. That, I said, already unzipping the tent. Come on, we need to check it out. Ethan grabbed my arm. Are you crazy? We don't know what's out there. It's probably just a coyote or something. I shook my head. That was no coyote, Ethan. It sounded wrong. Against his protests, I stepped out of the tent. The night was pitch black, the moon hidden behind thick clouds. I fumbled for my flashlight, clicking it on and sweeping the beam across our campsite. Nothing seemed out of place, but I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I swallowed hard. See, Ethan said, coming up behind me. Nothing there. Let's go back to... He was cut off by another howl, this one so close it seemed to vibrate through my bones. And then... I saw it, a pair of glowing yellow eyes reflecting my flashlight beam from the edge of the trees. Ethan, I whispered, my voice shaking. Run. We bolted for the van, scrambling inside and locking the doors. Through the windshield, I could see a massive shape emerging from the tree line. It was easily seven feet tall, covered in shaggy matted fur. Its face had an inhuman shape, snout elongated and filled with rows of sharp teeth. The creature loped towards our van, its movements unnaturally fluid for something so large. It reached us in seconds, slamming against the side of the vehicle with enough force to rock us. Start the engine, I yelled, but Ethan was already fumbling with the keys. The van roared to life just as the creature smashed a clawed hand through the driver's side window. Glass showered over us as Ethan threw the van into reverse, tires squealing. We tore out of the campsite, leaving our tent and supplies behind. In the rearview mirror, I could see the creature standing in the middle of the road watching us go. Its eyes seemed to glow brighter, and I swore I could see intelligence there, and hunger. We drove through the night, neither of us speaking. The adrenaline slowly faded, leaving us both shaky and exhausted. As the sun began to rise, we pulled into a small town called Pinecrest. 
The town seemed deserted, with boarded-up storefronts and empty streets. We finally found an open diner and stumbled inside, desperate for coffee and a chance to process what had happened. The lone waitress, an older woman with graying hair and tired eyes, looked us up and down as we slid into a booth. You boys look like you've seen a ghost, she said, pouring us each a cup of coffee without asking. Ethan and I exchanged glances. Something like that, I muttered. The waitress, her name tag read Doris, leaned in close. You didn't come from Devil's Lake, did you? I nodded and her face paled. Oh, you poor things, you're lucky to be alive. What do you mean? Ethan asked, his voice hoarse. Doris looked around the empty diner, then sat down across from us. People have been disappearing from that park for years, she said in a low voice. The official story is animal attacks, but she shook her head. We know better. What is it? I asked, leaning forward. That thing we saw, what was it? We don't know for sure, Doris replied. Some say it's a Wendigo. Others think it's some kind of government experiment gone wrong. All we know is that it's been haunting these woods for generations, and it's getting bolder. She stood up abruptly. You boys should leave town as soon as you can. It's not safe here, especially for outsiders. As she walked away, Ethan and I looked at each other, the reality of our situation sinking in. We were stranded in a strange town, with no supplies and a monster on our trail. What do we do now? Ethan asked. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my nerves. We need to find out more about this thing. Maybe there's a way to stop it. Little did I know, that decision would lead us down a path of horror and revelation that would change our lives forever. After finishing our coffee, Ethan and I decided to split up. He would try to find a garage to get our van's broken window fixed, while I headed to the local library to research the creature we'd encountered. The Pinecrest Public Library was a small, aging building with peeling paint and a musty smell. As I pushed open the heavy wooden door, a bell jingled softly, announcing my presence. The librarian, a thin man with thick glasses and a receding hairline, looked up from his desk. His eyes narrowed as he took in my disheveled appearance. Can I help you? he asked, his tone wary. I approached the desk, trying to look as non-threatening as possible. I'm looking for information on local legends, I said. Specifically, anything about a large creature in the woods around Devil's Lake. The librarian's face went pale, and he glanced nervously at the windows. I'm afraid we don't have any books on that subject, he said quickly. Perhaps you'd be interested in our local history section instead? I leaned in closer, lowering my voice. Please, I said. I saw something last night, something not natural. I need to know what it was. The librarian studied me for a long moment, then sighed. Follow me, he said, standing up. He led me to a back room filled with old boxes and filing cabinets. After rummaging through one of the cabinets, he pulled out a dusty folder. This isn't officially part of our collection, he explained, but it might have what you're looking for. I opened the folder to find newspaper clippings, handwritten accounts, and grainy photographs. The oldest clipping was dated 1923, describing a series of brutal animal attacks near Devil's Lake. As I flipped through the pages, a pattern emerged. Every few years, there would be a rash of disappearances or deaths, always explained away as animal attacks or tragic accidents. But the eyewitness accounts told a different story, a massive bipedal creature with glowing eyes and razor-sharp claws. One photograph taken in 1978 showed a blurry shape at the edge of a forest. Even in the poor quality image, I could make out the creature's hulking form and elongated snout. What is this thing? I muttered, more to myself than the librarian. The old timers call it the shadow talker, the librarian said softly. They say it feeds on fear as much as flesh. The more terrified its victims are, the stronger it becomes. I looked up at him, a chill running down my spine. How do you stop it? The librarian shook his head. No one knows. Some have tried over the years, but... He trailed off, his implication clear. As I continued to read through the folder, one name kept appearing. Dr. Evelyn Blackwood, a cryptozoologist who had studied the creature in the 1990s. Her last known address was right here in Pinecrest. I thanked the librarian and left the library, my mind racing. 
If Dr. Blackwood was still alive, she might have the answers we needed. But as I stepped out onto the street, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. High up on a nearby rooftop, I caught a glimpse of movement, a large, dark shape that disappeared as soon as I spotted it. The Shadow Talker had followed us to Pinecrest, and I had a sinking feeling that our nightmare was far from over. I met up with Ethan at a local garage where he was arranging repairs for the van. After filling him in on what I'd learned at the library, we decided to seek out Dr. Blackwood. Her house was on the outskirts of town, a Victorian-style building that had seen better days. Paint peeled from the siding, and overgrown bushes crowded the front porch. As we approached the door, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were making a terrible mistake. I knocked, and after a long moment, the door creaked open. A woman in her late sixties peered out at us, her gray hair wild and her eyes sharp behind thick glasses. Dr. Blackwood? I asked. She nodded warily. Who's asking? I introduced myself and Ethan, explaining our encounter at Devil's Lake and what we'd learned in town. As I spoke, Dr. Blackwood's expression changed from suspicion to intense interest. Come in, she said abruptly, stepping back from the door. Quickly now. We followed her into a cluttered living room, every surface covered with books, papers, and strange artifacts. Dr. Blackwood cleared off two chairs for us and perched on the edge of a worn sofa. So, she said, leaning forward, you've seen the Shadow Talker and lived to tell about it. That's unusual. What exactly is it? Ethan asked. Dr. Blackwood sighed. That's the question, isn't it? I've spent decades studying the creature, and I'm still not sure. It has characteristics of several cryptids, the size and strength of a Sasquatch, the predatory nature of a Wendigo, the shape-shifting abilities of a Skinwalker. But it's something else entirely. She stood and walked to a large map on the wall, covered in red pins. I've tracked its movements over the years. It seems to hibernate for long periods, then awaken for feeding frenzies that can last weeks or even months. Feeding frenzies? I echoed, feeling sick. Dr. Blackwood nodded grimly. It doesn't just kill for food. It seems to feed on fear itself. The terror of its victims makes it stronger, faster, more intelligent. How do we stop it? Ethan asked. The cryptozoologist turned to face us, her expression grave. That's the problem. Conventional weapons seem to have little effect. I've heard stories of it being shot, stabbed, even hit by cars. And always, it comes back stronger. She walked to a bookshelf and pulled down an old, leather-bound volume. There's one theory based on some very old Native American legends. They speak of a ritual that can bind the creature, trapping it in a dormant state for generations. What kind of ritual? I asked, leaning forward. Dr. Blackwood opened the book, revealing pages covered in strange symbols and diagrams. It's complex and dangerous. It requires a willing sacrifice someone to act as a vessel to contain the creature's essence. A heavy silence fell over the room as the implications of her words sank in. That's insane, Ethan said finally. We can't just sacrifice someone. I was about to agree when a thunderous crash came from outside. We all rushed to the window to see the shadow talker standing in Dr. Blackwood's front yard, its yellow eyes fixed on the house. It's found us, Dr. Blackwood whispered, her face pale. We're out of time. The shadow talker let out a bone-chilling howl and charged towards the house. We scrambled away from the windows as it slammed into the front door, the wood splintering under its immense strength. Quick to the basement, Dr. Blackwood shouted, grabbing the leather-bound book and a bag from beside her chair. We followed her down a narrow staircase, the sounds of the creature's assault echoing through the house. The basement was a makeshift laboratory filled with strange equipment and jars of unidentifiable specimens. Dr. Blackwood slammed the heavy metal door behind us and threw the bolt. That won't hold it for long, she said grimly. We need to prepare the ritual. As if to emphasize her point, a deafening crash came from upstairs, followed by the sound of heavy footsteps and splintering wood. Are you serious? Ethan exclaimed. We can't actually do this ritual. It's, it's murder. Dr. Blackwood fixed him with a steely gaze. And what do you think that thing upstairs will do to us if we don't? To everyone in this town. Sometimes sacrifices must be made for the greater good. I felt sick to my stomach, but I couldn't deny the logic of her words. 
The creature upstairs was a monster, a killer that had terrorized this region for generations. If there was a chance to stop it, I'll do it, I heard myself say. I'll be the vessel. Ethan grabbed my arm. Marcus, no, you can't. I shook him off. I have to, Ethan. Elena's gone. I've got nothing left to lose. Dr. Blackwood nodded solemnly. Very well, we must hurry. She began drawing a complex symbol on the floor with chalk, consulting the book as she worked. Ethan paced nervously, casting worried glances at the ceiling as the Shadow Talker's rampage continued above us. What do I need to do? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. When the time comes, you must let the creature in, Dr. Blackwood explained. Open yourself to it. Become a willing vessel. Then I'll complete the binding ritual. Before I could ask for more details, a tremendous crash shook the entire house. Dust rained down from the ceiling, and we heard the Shadow Talker's triumphant roar. It's coming, Dr. Blackwood said, her voice tight with fear. Get in the circle, Marcus, now! I stepped into the center of the chalk symbol, my heart pounding. Dr. Blackwood began chanting in a language I didn't recognize, her voice rising as the sounds of destruction grew closer. The basement door exploded inward, and there it was, the Shadow Talker, its massive form filling the doorway. Up close it was even more terrifying than I remembered. Its matted fur was caked with blood and dirt, and its yellow eyes gleamed with an unnatural intelligence. Dr. Blackwood's chanting grew louder, more frantic. The creature's gaze fixed on me, and I felt a wave of terror wash over me. It was all I could do to stay standing as it lumbered towards me. Marcus! Ethan shouted. He grabbed a nearby chair and hurled it at the shadow talker. The creature barely seemed to notice, swatting the chair aside like it was made of paper. Let it in, Marcus, Dr. Blackwood yelled over the chaos. You must accept it willingly. The shadow talker was mere feet away now. I could smell its foul breath, see the razor-sharp teeth in its elongated muzzle. Every instinct screamed at me to run, to fight, to do anything but what I knew I had to do. I closed my eyes and spread my arms wide. I accept you, I whispered. The creature lunged forward, and I felt a searing pain as its claws raked across my chest. But instead of tearing me apart, I felt a strange sensation, as if something was being poured into me. The pain intensified, becoming an agony beyond anything I'd ever experienced. I heard Ethan screaming my name, felt the vibrations of Dr. Blackwood's chanting through the floor. The world seemed to fade away, leaving only the pain and a growing presence in my mind, ancient, hungry, and filled with an unfathomable malevolence. Then, suddenly, it was over. I opened my eyes to find myself still standing in the circle. The shadow talker was gone, but I could feel its presence inside me, struggling against the bonds of the ritual. Dr. Blackwood slumped to the floor, exhausted. Ethan rushed to my side, his face pale with shock. Marcus? Are you... you? I nodded slowly, feeling the weight of the creature's consciousness pressing against my own. I think so, for now. The days that followed were a blur. Dr. Blackwood explained that the ritual had bound the Shadow Talker to me, trapping its essence within my body. But it wasn't a permanent solution. The creature was still there, waiting for a chance to break free. We left Pinecrest as soon as we could, but not before Dr. Blackwood gave us a warning. The binding won't last forever, she said. You'll need to renew it regularly, or the creature will eventually break free. She gave us a copy of the ritual and instructions on how to perform it. And Marcus, she added, her eyes filled with sympathy. You must be careful. The Shadow Talker will try to influence you, to corrupt you from within. Stay vigilant. As we drove away from Pinecrest, I could feel the truth of her words. The creature was a constant presence in my mind, whispering dark thoughts, trying to tempt me with promises of power. Ethan noticed my discomfort. We'll figure this out, he said, trying to sound confident. There has to be a way to get rid of it for good. I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. I didn't have the heart to tell him that a part of me, a growing part, didn't want to get rid of the Shadow Talker. Its power was intoxicating, and I found myself wondering what I could do with it if I just gave in a little. Months passed, and we fell into a routine. Every full moon, Ethan would help me perform the binding ritual, reinforcing the mystical chains that kept the Shadow Talker trapped within me. We traveled, constantly, 
never staying in one place for too long, always on the lookout for any sign that the creature's influence was spreading beyond me. But despite our precautions, incidents began to occur. A hiker found torn to shreds in a national park we'd passed through. A family massacred in their home two towns over from where we'd stayed. Each time I woke with blood under my fingernails and gaps in my memory. Ethan grew more worried with each passing day. We need to find a permanent solution, he insisted. This can't go on forever. I agreed, but a part of me, the part that was becoming more and more intertwined with the shadow talker, resisted the idea. The power coursing through my veins was addictive, and the creature's hunger was becoming my own. It all came to a head one stormy night, almost a year after our encounter in Pinecrest. We were holed up in a remote cabin, preparing for another binding ritual. When I felt the shadow talker surge within me with unprecedented strength, pain ripped through my body as the creature fought for control. I could feel my bones shifting, my skin stretching as the shadow talker tried to manifest physically. Ethan, I gasped, run. But my brother stood his ground, the ritual book clutched in his hands. No, he said firmly. We finish this, now. As he began to chant, I felt the shadow talker's rage and terror. It knew that this time was different. Ethan wasn't just trying to bind it, but to destroy it completely. The creature's desperation gave it strength, and I felt my control slipping. My vision blurred, replaced by the shadow talker's predatory gaze. I could smell Ethan's fear, feel the hunger rising within me. With the last shred of my own will, I locked eyes with my brother. Do it, I managed to say. End this. Ethan's voice rose to a shout, the words of the ritual echoing through the cabin. I felt a tremendous pressure building inside me, as if I was being torn apart from the inside. Then, with a sound like thunder, the shadow talker was ripped from my body. I saw it for a brief moment, a writhing mass of shadows and teeth, before it dissolved into nothingness. The silence that followed was deafening. I collapsed to the floor, every nerve in my body screaming in agony. Ethan rushed to my side, his face etched with worry. Is it, is it over? I asked weakly. Ethan nodded, tears in his eyes. It's over. The shadow talker is gone. Years have passed since that night in the cabin. Ethan and I have tried to return to some semblance of a normal life. But the scars, both physical and psychological, remain. Sometimes in my darkest moments, I can still feel an echo of the shadow talker's presence. A whisper in the back of my mind, a flicker of movement in the corner of my eye. But whether it's a remnant of the creature or just my own trauma, I can't say for sure. One thing I know is this. The world is full of shadows, and not all monsters wear their nature so openly. The real challenge isn't facing the creatures that lurk in the dark, but confronting the darkness within ourselves. As for me, I keep moving, keep searching, for redemption, for understanding, or maybe just for a night's sleep, untroubled by nightmares. And always, always, I keep one eye on the shadows. Because once you've seen what lurks in the dark, you can never truly unsee it. And sometimes, the greatest horror is knowing that the monster might have been inside you all along.